It's another wonderful, kind of delayed episode of the Worldwide Weebcast here on Red Leaf Retro. And we have, surprisingly enough, a full group uh, yet again. Hickey, <laughs> senior person, and Tori. <laughs> I'm dying here. <laughs> right. I was dying on Saturday, which is why we're doing this today. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Hey, thanks for the hangover, JD. That was real great. Way well, in the I middle mean, of the night for me. Thanks. <laughs> wake up in the morning and just <clears throat> all morning get great. Yeah, we're really going to record this podcast. <laughs> uh, well, uh, to be fair, I did have some rather bad news. <laughs> well, you tried, and that's all that matters. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I was up on time, and then after about a 30 to 40 minutes of being up, it was a lost cause. <laughs> <laughs> so, today on the agenda, we got our How You Doings, we got Tori's Quest update, my Shonen update, we're going to follow it up with our, our topic of discussion, which is Studio Talk, which is going to cover the 70s to now, so we've deemed it kind of a Gynax to Trigger kind of thing, going, of course, before Gynax. We're gonna Toei get to trigger. Toei to trigger. It's even <laughs> yeah before Toei to trigger. We got Hickey's summer season update. That should be fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. And our review topic, our review talk topic of the episode is old school anime shorts, which was picked by to- uh, Tori, which was actually pretty good. Yeah, you're right. That is my fault. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> we'll probably slip some TQ talk in there too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, you will slip some TQ talk in there. Yeah. I will do none of that. <laughs> TQ's good. Shut up. <clears throat> TQ saves the anime apparently and gives me physical pain. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Genesis prodding. Oh. Uh, <laughs> well, all right. Well, how is our senior person doing today? Oh, man, I ain't so bad. I just got out of work, and I'm uh, cracking open a beer just to start this podcast off. Excellent. Should be fantastic. I am not drinking beer till at least Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you poor baby. And Tori, how you doing? Well, you know, slowly dying. Uh, it's Just way waiting for the inevitability that is death. Not even that. It's just that it's way late where I am right now, and I'm going to be up until, like, way in the morning now because of you. (laughs) Oh, yeah, it's 12.30 where you live. Oh, yeah. Great. Yes. Ah, come on. We won't be here that long, maybe. A.M. Probably. (laughs) Well, we'll see. We'll see. (laughs) Don't make promises you can't keep. All right. And how's Brazil doing? Pretty shitty, I guess. The politics is going to shit. The economy is going to shit. But, hey, I had a shitty week. Last week was pretty shitty, but today was fine. I just arrived from work as well. I need a shower. And yeah, I might take a shower after. <laughs> At least there was no coup d'etat, I guess. Uh, some yeah. people say we had Yet. one, but I don't. The police didn't go back on people. strike again, did they? Who? Oh, the police? No, the police is not oh, on strike. Damn it. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. So before we get really, really uh, personal and getting getting through that kind of nonsense, uh, Tori, you must update us on your quest and how's it yes. going. My quest is going great. I've had two great shows in a row now, so that's fantastic. Uh, I'm finally done with the 70s and I'm heading into the 80s with uh, Ashton Ojo 2. Starting the 80s are really strong, so I might, I'm going to have three good shows in a row. That makes me excited. The show I just finished is uh, Akagi no Anne, or uh, Anne of Green Gables, which is a, uh, uh, you know, slice of life story Mm -hmm. based on a Western uh, novel, and uh, just a 50 episode coming of age story following Anne from, she, uh, Anne, which is an orphan when she arrives at her new home when she's 11, and all the way until she is 17 years old, and quote quote, unquote an adult, and... uh, yeah, I, I. It was just, it was fantastic. It was definitely my second favorite show so far on the quest after Ashtano Joe. <laughs> Excellent. We'll definitely be getting into the studio that did Akagi no Anne later. Uh, I got yeah. a little nippon. <laughs> yeah, Studio Nippon. It's, <laughs> they have a distinct art style, but we'll definitely go into that. Yeah, uh, hearing you talk about Akagi no Anne really got me uh, interested in watching it myself. Just seeing the I backgrounds. Definitely... Yeah, I, like the backgrounds are fantastic. I definitely think it's worth a watch. 
And I think it's like I think this is one of those uh, shows that we could that you could also fool a lot of like the more modern anime fans that like you know the slice of life shows kind of that fool them into try try that out, especially because you know it has ties to Studio Ghibli even with Hayao Miyazaki and people like that that started founded uh, Ghibli working on it, having main roles in it even. <laughs> Well, if that's all you got to say, then we can go into my Shonen update, which mm -hmm. apparently a lot of people are interested in, or at least one. <laughs> at least one. At least one. <laughs> so for, the, for those that don't know, I've, I've uh, essentially been catching up on my summer anime, uh, or sh Shonen anime, because the summer season I'm not watching too much. Ooh. And, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I'm not really liking too much about it, but oh. I'm watching. I'm finishing Fairy Tale 2014, Gintama, the very first quote unquote season. It's over 200 episodes. I'm catching up with Detective Conan, One Piece, and then I'm watching Toriko and Prince of Tennis. And honestly, Toriko has been taking up a lot of my time. Uh, that's a sh that's a fighting show in which characters power up using food. And it's 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 a lot of fun. It's really goofy. The character models are are goofy as well. Um, I wish they would do more with some of the side characters. Uh, but it's a it's a fun show. I'm actually enjoying it. It's of course a Toei show. <laughs> well, I hear it's right. You're right on the cusp of where it goes in the shitter. Um, I'm about halfway to that point from what what I've been told, and that's the sixty mark. I I'm at episode thirty, around that point, and. That's around the Ice Hell arc. So the names are pretty funny. It's not really one-on-one -on -one battles so much as it is mostly against the animals they're fighting. But there is an evil organization involved. And there are there is the climax of each fight with that evil organization. But before that, they usually fight animals. And it's usually cool uh, getting to that point. Um, I'm almost done with the, going into Prince of Tennis. I'm almost done with a certain team they they always go they bounce team to team on who they face and it's usually just how a tennis player will adjust to their new opponent just fun um i've really hit a snag around the episode 70 mark where it kind of feels filler-esque you know what i mean you you senpai you've seen prince of tennis i sure have and um you're definitely at that point where it starts to drag a little bit i i think the manga is a little bit better done but i mean the series is still great even when you have to trudge through all that filler welcome to shonen series i suppose yeah i mean it's it's definitely noticeable where it hits that point um detective conan it's just it's still detective conan no, there hasn't been a, a mystery arc a couple episodes or even four that have really caught my eye i'm in and for reference i'm in the uh the mid 850s <laughs> I think. Yeah, but you're no. taking the true path, aren't you? Eight twenties. That's what I'm doing. I'm doing the what? The true path, where you don't watch all the filler or the non-canon things. Um. Yeah. Once I got to, once I got to a certain point, there wasn't really a reason for me to continue watching the TV originals, even though so, there are there is the occasional that that the mystery is there and it keeps you engaged. But at this point, with so many episodes, I, I really just want to stay in line with what's canon. So, it, it, and even in the canon in the 800s, there hasn't been a good mystery to to really define it so far. There, there, there was one catch with the Black Organization that it goes back to, and that was cool, but it didn't really go into a lot of detail. And I was kind of disappointed I mean... in that. You're kind of running into like the Simpsons problem, you know. It's been going on so long. What do you what do you do at this point? Yeah, uh, it's very noticeable in Detective Conan right now. It, it's happened ever since the what I what I what people call the Sherlock Holmes arc, where Conan goes to London. It's been it's been kind of a downhill trend since there since that point, and they haven't really done much since there. Uh, Fairy Tale is god awful, honestly. Yeah. I'm halfway through the oh, very last oh. season. It's 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 just straight fan service. It's pandering. It's there's no real story I care about. It's it's going to be a, a trek to go through. That's that's kind of the slowest moving one. Um, Gintama's funny. It's it's still parody. What what can what more can you say about that? Uh, no episode is really 
caught my eye yet to truly discuss. And then One Piece, I've I've watched about 20 episodes in a couple days, so that's still very addictive. I'm in the I'm nearing the end of the Dress Rosa arc against a villain called uh, uh what's his name? Um, Do Flamingo, and he's a freaking psychopath, and it's awesome. <laughs> so it's good it's good news for One Piece that you can create a villain you know 600 plus episodes in and still kind of surprise you with how freaky they are <laughs> man oda's a psychopath i have no idea how he does it yeah it's usually shown in when they when they get to a point and the characters power up too much to be overpowered it gets overwhelming hence the dragon balls dragon ball yeah, z looking at you dragon ball z <laughs> yeah even you haka show fell fell into that uh really diverse, i mean to be but... fair toriyama didn't want to continue dragon ball z yeah he wanted to stop it at the cell arc, and then they just forced him to keep going. Yeah, and so, it's very noticeable. Can't blame him too uh, much. Luckily, One Piece hasn't fallen into that quite yet. I thought they were going to fall into that with uh, uh, Fishman Island arc. But it was more of less a reintroduction after a time skip, which was pretty cool. So, that's the Shonen update. What is next on the agenda, actually? Is it straight into our studios? Hey, that's straight into our studios. Oh man, yeah, we can go straight into that. Yeah, Hickey, we'll get we'll get to you after the studio talk. Is kind of a uh, a little break. Okay. Yeah, give you more time to think. <laughs> yeah, I still need to decide how am I going. To well, we do did this. tell him to. <laughs> we did tell him to come here. I don't know, mm, two hours ago. <laughs> we were doing this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm. T- <laughs> so. The purpose of this is to kind of go through. We've had we've had conversations with with whether it be friends or acquaintances. Where uh, do studios matter? What do they do? What's their purpose? Do we tend to? What do we expect out of a studio when they get a show? Does anybody have any thoughts about that before we get into any of them? I mean, uh, there's there's some studios that have a really distinctive feel to them, and. For instance, some of the studios I don't like, I don't like PA Works, usually. I don't like Kill Annie, usually. I don't like A1, usually. But you still need to give these things, like, a shot. You gotta put something out for them. And, um, most of the time I wind up not liking them. That's why I have so many drop shows at, like, episode three. Because mm-hmm. I feel like if you can't do your job by, you know, a movie length or at least something close to it, you, it wasn't for me anyway. Right. Yeah. Whereas KyoAni, I'll just kind of avoid anyway because of how their studios set up. <laughs> everyone in there is well, not, not everyone, most of the people in there are in house, so I don't, I don't like their style as it sits. Again, I'll still try some of their shows if someone, if someone from our Discord or our new group on Mal sends me a like, you should watch this. You might like it. It lines up with a lot of things. You like, I'll give it a go. But for the most part, they're not my, they're not my bag. So that's yeah. it. I mean, like I say, I'm uh, I'm often more of the belief that, like, uh, in general, except for like the very obvious, like the uh, the polygons, the uh, QNEs, like the um, studios, like that. I don't think studios matter that much, but that's just because of how a lot of studios are set up. Uh, like, I've kind of gotten into the habit of more when I look at shows, I look at staff, and I try to find, figure out who does what, who is going to be working, and then it's like figure out because it. I feel like it gives you a better idea over of like the overall show, what's going to be in the show, knowing who does what on the show. It's like, for example, you know, it's like if Senpai were to look at a show and then he would say, and I see like Mario Kart is doing a writing, right? I would immediately, I would know, notice there. It's like, this is something for me. I like her style of writing. But when it's like Senpai, he would look at this and he would say, that this show isn't for me. I don't like, I don't like her writing. So mm-hmm. I feel like you get more of a like seeing that since basically don't sit mario kart moves moves around a lot good example there but like you know <laughs> and i feel like you don't really get that representation when you see the studio because in a lot of cases with a lot of studios they're kind of just you know the one that takes out that like gets assigned the task of adapting whatever source material and then you know they go from there <laughs> well that's kind of where i come from because usually studios get kind of typecast into the series they do so I wind up doing, you know, like, PA Works is always doing tragic girlfriend love stories. I mean, not always, obviously, but more often than not, they're doing something romance-based. 
A1's doing kind of like, I wouldn't call it generic, but I mean, it sure feels that way recently. Generic A1. light novel fodder. A1 does everything, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, A1. yeah, they're also, they're also <laughs> totally uh, freelance. Yeah. Yeah, totally studio, studio tends to get into a, a rhythm of what type of show they do. That's actually why I was so shocked when um, Trigger was doing Kizniver. I suppose we'll get into that later. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, uh, what about you, Hickey? I think studios, they, they matter. I, although, yeah, we are talking about a, an industry where we have a lot of freelancers. And just like Toddy said, sometimes uh, most, of the, most of the crew that is doing an anime is made of freelancers. But the studio matter as a company as someone who's in the middle of the negotiations. They get the money, they need to go out and seek for those freelancers. Sometimes they have uh, they have people working for them. Uh, they don't need to go out to look at freelancers, but they matter. They are the, the, the main, the middle. They get the money, they get the advertisement going, they have the place. You know, although you have the, a crew of fil freelancers doing the anime, you're gonna have a president, you're gonna have a vice president, you're gonna have someone to look at the advertisement, you're gonna have someone to look at, you know, what anime are we doing, the shadow and every, everything of those things they weren't doing by the, uh, they were they aren't done by freelancers. They're actually in place. They are the studio. And of course, you have the powerhouses that train a bunch of animators and give us jams like Yo Yoshinari and those kind of people. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, the only, uh, the I don't only want thing... everyone to think go to it. Okay, yeah. Uh, the only thing I just want to comment on that is um, when, it, when it comes to the studio, right? I feel like the studio often gets a kind of false, like... But it's, it's weird, right? Because it, it varies from studio to studio. But I feel like people have like false expectations of what a studio actually does. And that's for the whole studio gets the money to hire freelancers. You're right. It's just that freelancers are hired on a like uh, on a like familiarity basis. They people don't really hire people they don't know. So it's kind of like they go to people that work there, ask them if they know anybody, then they bring them in, and it's like that's usually how that works. And uh, when it comes well, to advertisements and stuff like that, <laughs> that's also kind of taken out of the studio's hands, considering the fact you have the production committee, which works around the studio, which is basically everybody that puts money into this project. And it's kind of, they're kind of the one that pull, pulls a lot of the strings and makes a lot of the decisions over the studio. And that's where I feel like studio, the studio is indeed the, the middleman. But it's kind of, it's the middleman that kind of has most things that happens in the process of making an anime taken out of their own hands. They're kind of just, in a lot of cases, kind of just there. Except for, of course, as you pointed out, the powerhouses where they have a bit more say in their own hmm. productions. So as I was going to say, um, I don't want people to think that we're typecasting like very hard. It's just when we say these, we're talking in general. When we, when we expect something of a studio, it's just what they normally put out. I still do what Tori does. I still look at who's making something I'm going to watch. It's just if I see a studio behind it, I have an expectation for what they usually put out, and then I look at the staff. For, I don't care who puts it out. If Mario Okada wrote it, chances have it, I'm not going to like it. But if she, if she didn't, if it was, I don't know, let's say, uh, Urubuchi again, chances are I'm going to like it if he wrote the whole thing instead of just episode one, I'll know it's zero. Uh, <laughs> So we kind of do the same thing, just how much importance we put on one thing over the other and when we start doing that process. Uh, just from a fan's perspective, when I'm looking at a, when I'm looking at a studio, and I, want the, I want the studio to do something, especially uh, when it, if they're doing, say, a manga adaptation or a light novel or whatever it may be, I want them doing something that they have experience with. Like, I don't want... JC staff doing a mech show. <laughs> Which something want Sunrise and Trigger to do it. <laughs> so, something tells me JC staff wouldn't be as good as say Sunrise would be. Have you seen Heavy uh, Object? <laughs> <laughs> My point stands. <laughs> no, it definitely does. I, I don't see your <laughs> argument. <laughs> that wasn't an argument. That was just to, uh, like to confirm what you said. <laughs> 
you know, it, when you when you see something like that, just from uh, me putting a fan's perspective on there, you just know uh, this show might not turn out so well. Uh, but let's let's start with the '70s, and the way the way I went about this is I went decades uh, up until about the t- the 2000s, and um, basically I didn't hit any of the we're not hitting any small studio because you know studios come and go. We're hitting the ones that have have withstood essentially the test of time and what we kind of care about today. Uh, and the '70s, what I'm going to do is I'm going to list. Uh, I'm going to say the studio, I'm going to say about three anime that they're known for, or, or that people mostly have heard of, and then I'll say the next one, and then I'll go, okay, the end of the decade, what do you guys think? So, first one's Toei, uh, they, they've made things like One Piece, Dragon Ball, and Sailor Moon, then there's TMS Entertainment, that's Detective Conan, Lupin the Third, Yomushi Petal, um, and other sports, smaller sports anime, quote-unquote smaller. Uh, then in the late 70s, it was Madhouse. They've done Death Note, Monster, Black Lagoon, and Studio Nippon. She's done Hunter Hunter, Future Boy Conan, and Akage no An, just for you, Tori. Yay. So that's the 70s. <laughs> All right, so uh, I think I think most people who are here, anyone who grew up in America, or I think most of the world knows uh, Toei Animation. I mean, for people outside of the country... Because America got totally shafted, they did a uh, Saint Seiya, they did a uh, Kinikuman, Galaxy Express. Well, they took part in it. Uh, like, I know they at least did the uh, Fist of the North Star movies. To- Toei's been around well. a long time. They they were definitely the heavy hitter of the seventies. And Toei and is even most people's childhood. Yeah. Childhood. Yeah. I mean, they yeah. did Devil Man. Like, they're just hugely influential, especially in this time, which I think the 70s, the 80s, those were basically their heyday. This is exactly when you wanted Toei to make something. I mean, you can argue as every of, decade they've had a hit show that makes them money. <laughs> as of recently, anything that isn't, you know, shown in heavy, I think, is usually just trashed by them. But it's hard to find something that isn't shown in by them at this point. <laughs> well, I mean, just recently in the last... Uh, in the spring season there was kato which they've they did some what everyone knows how i feel about that Uh, yeah they totally shit the bet on that didn't they but that's not that's not the fault of toei that's the fault of the source material itself and but they they actually chose to do a a new like cg kind of pseudo 2d environment thing with it well sadly we know that but a lot of uh i I won't call them smaller fans but fans that aren't in as deep fans whose power level hasn't risen over 9,000 to make the <laughs> Dragon Ball reference or well, Dragon Ball Z um, they don't understand how studios work or they don't care both are totally fine but uh, they're not going to make that connection that you know this source material was totally bullshit written at the end so they just threw magic at the end they're going to go well they really shit the bed on this what the hell happened that yeah. writing was awful, and they're going to score it low. And it deserves to be scored low. It sure does. Ultimately, it's not Toei's <laughs> fault. <laughs> Tori, Hickey, what do you got over Toei? Anything? Uh, I mean, well... First no, and first, but... I just want to uh, piss on your parade a little bit. Uh, Carter was original. <laughs> Oh great! So, so uh, it was written like even shit. better. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no. What I what I want to say is like, I mean, yes, Toei is a lot of people's. Um, Maybe it should have turned into it's a like childhood. <laughs> <laughs> to- uh, Toei is a lot of people's childhood. Uh, sadly, though, it's not my childhood. Uh, they don't really have anything. Like I think most things I've watched from them, I've watched recently, even though a lot of it is old. So I don't really have much of a like connection to Toei. I just kind of know yeah. him as that like ginormous studio that uh, that is almost too big for its own good at this point. Uh, it's I don't mean that in the sense that they're doing so well that they can't that they can't do anything wrong. I just mean that in the sense that there has been over the years there's been some stories coming out of Toei on uh, production issues happening because people just do not agree or messages do not come across because they the company itself is so is so goddamn large. Uh, but yeah, no, like, but I mean, they do put out stuff that I enjoy, especially like Galaxy Express 3.9. It's probably 
probably, at least just right at the top of my head, my favorite thing I've seen by Toei. Or Mononoke, your slam dunk. Mononoke, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. They did as well. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of thing, right? I am just trying to think, like, what did Toei do when I'm blanking? Because that is my relationship with Toei. I'm like, I know they did, like, a lot. And a lot of stuff I probably know off the top of my head. I just, since I don't have that connection, I don't immediately, like, connect the name <laughs> Toei to anything. Yeah, what's the problem? What out of these 700 anime have you seen? <laughs> yeah. That's kind of the issue. <laughs> but yeah. Well, like Senpai said, the Toei is the most part of my childhood. Uh, I mean, Toei is, I think the Toei anime was the first anime I've, I've ever watched before I knew what anime was, when that was only weird Asian cartoons. <laughs> And you don't you don't need to be old because most of those toy shows, Dragon Ball, Sensei, they they are very old. But even if you grew up in the early two thousands, like I did, I'm I'm not that old. Uh, you might see something toy, and a lot of iconic moments in in anime. Of course, you you have the uh, the source material, but still, toy was the studio. Who gave life to those mm -hmm. source materials? Who went to uh, televisions, uh, like uh, televisions abroad, Japan, and said, "Look, can you show this up on your on on your TV?" And people sure messed up with censorship, but still, uh, we got it. It's probably because uh, oh. the reason I'm here. Probably, of course, everyone knows the scene yeah. of Dragon Ball. Everyone knows the scene of Sensei. How old is Shonen Jump, for the record? I can look that up for you, but you're going to have to keep talking while I do Okay, that. well, uh, moving on to the next one of the 70s. Uh, these others are basically just the other studios of the 70s. Because if you look at a list of shows that came out, everything was basically Toei, or at least the big shows. And then there was TMS Entertainment, Madhouse, and Nippon. And as I said, TMS Entertainment, uh, they're a bit different. Madhouse, we'll get into that, and Nippon. So, what, yeah. what, Hickey, what is your experience with TMS Entertainment? Sorry to cut you off, but it's uh, August 168. All, just talking about T Say again? August 168. 168, yeah. So, okay, what I wanted to bring up was it seemed for a long time there that Toei Animation, if, they, if, if, the, if it was a hit in Shonen Jump, Toei got it. And that was the yeah. case for a long time. At least that's just from what I can, I can see from it. For the most part, that is still the case. <laughs> yeah. Anything heavy goes directly to Toei. Yeah. Uh, some of the smaller stuff or stuff from other magazines is what kind of gets dispersed out. And uh, we'll we'll get to when when Toei wasn't the uh, wasn't the only <laughs> studio to get shown and jump stuff later. So Hickey, what you were saying? Yeah, well, I was saying that first of all, we're gonna get we need to to give TMS Entertainment and Madhouse a praise. Of course, they are not as much as noble mm -hmm. as they are in the well, past. It's definitely not the Madhouse you know. But still, they are survivors. Yes, they they are survivors. They've been here since the the seventies. Most of those studios are very very old. People sometimes I think they don't realize that because. Especially if you watch a bunch mm -hmm. of seasonal anime, or like, uh, for example, we're gonna talk about it, but KyoAni is like 80s or 90s, but people only noticed KyoAni in well, the Kyo, Well, yeah, KyoAni... But man, those, those two just... Yeah, KyoAni, holding... we'll get to them, but uh, just to say something, um, they weren't really relevant until the mid-2000s. Yeah. Yeah, I know, but I, what I'm talking about is that those studios, they are very old, and we need to praise because we know how the the industry. Oh, yeah, is, I mean, I'm I'm more or less. No, it's the the way I wrote this out rough. is I'm more or less am sticking the studio in a certain time frame when they started becoming relevant. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. I mean, Kiyoani early on was a in between yeah. studio anyway, so. Right. <laughs> yeah. So like TMS Entertainment. Uh, Usual uh, nowadays, they are like kind of hit and miss for me. Uh, I I sure watched a bunch of 
the things they they pull out not much of uh, older shows because i think they were like tms only tms or something like that then they became TMS uh, they tokyo, were, tokyo movie, movie studio or yeah. tokyo movie Shensha. yeah yeah so like i'm more i'm more uh use it to the the entertainment at the <laughs> end not the first one so but it's very hit and miss they also they always do a good job but you know they are not very selective i like i like to think of tms do. as consistent <laughs> true mm, i wouldn't say that yeah I definitely wouldn't say that i don't know for us for for a studio that's been around since the 70s and they they seem to consistently put out at least one hit show that's pretty well, consistent. For instance, uh, they put out they put out D Gray Man, and then they just put out Hollow. Then there's Real Life that came out recently in Orange. Yeah. But then there's some there's some real shows that I think are just bad. Oh yeah, I mean, I, that, and that's been the case since the '70s as well. They're they're it's either it's either good or bad. It doesn't seem to be any in between, but they're consistently that way. But I mean, they're good. So really good have, though. Come on, Loop on the well, third I, I do, Akira. Like, come on. <laughs> I really, I really do love. <laughs> Like D. Gray Man, Akira, all that. But I mean, you have to remember, TMS and Madhouse did a series like All Out. <laughs> they sure <laughs> they did, did uh, didn't they? <laughs> they oh, did yeah. Trickster. <laughs> sure did. Well, sp- on, yeah. nobody well, talks of, about these things. Come on. So I I want to save Madhouse because they're they're an interesting case uh, for when we get to the two thousands. Well, they became a powerhouse. Everyone knows that. Yeah. <laughs> There, something happened during that time, and we'll get to that. So we'll skip Madhouse from that for now, and move on to Nippon, which is Nippon. an interesting case for the seventies. Uh, they, I like to see Nippon as kind of the more mature side of anime during these during that time during this time, mm-hmm. especially doing shows like Future Boy Conan and Akagi no An, and they had some guy named Miyazaki involved with them. And a lot of other Studio some Ghibli guy. guys, and you, and Isao yeah, Takahara, guy. you might know these guys. You know? Yeah, uh, <laughs> they they had quite a bit to do with this studio and kind of where they got their start. And you can see a lot of a Studio Ghibli style with this studio back in the seventies. Well, shit, some of these series I'm looking at right now are just straight up legendary. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you have a uh, Dog of Flanders, the Kage no Han. Yeah. Oh, God. And, and that's kind of interna- their stick, and they're right? international hits too. Yeah, and that's kind of their stick, right? Because what what Nippon did, they were they did a lot of stuff, and especially Hayao Miyazaki and Isao Takahara, like they did a lot of stuff for a anime programming uh, thing called World Masterpiece Theater, which the the whole stick for that was literally to take like world famous novels or short stories or anything and kind of make animated series based off of those. Yeah, and they were they were it was a hit in the West. Um, even when I was living in Germany, uh, a show like Heidi Heidi of the Alps was very popular. Uh, people talked about that watching that as a kid, and it even though it was a show from the seventies, people talked about it in in the mid two thousands when I was over there. I mean, <laughs> shit, man, they did a Jungle Story, they or the Jungle Book. They did uh, the Sound of Music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they did uh, Arabian Nights. Yeah, they have some solid work. Tom Sawyer, like, these are huge stories. Yeah, so they didn't mess around. It's a very different... And, and to think that this is the same studio that that, that that then went on to do the original Hunter Hunter is is <laughs> fascinating of seeing a, seeing a studio evolve well, I can, uh, I can... with the staff moving on. Yeah, but I think a I big can... thing as well that happened was World Masterpiece Theater got cancelled. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It, yeah. was, it was definitely a product of its time. <laughs> I can uh, I can really agree looking through this list. I haven't really done a lot of research on Nippon. But um, looking through this list, it seems like what you said earlier, where they're a very adult side of the story, I find them to be uh, kind of like that. They also did Ori Watepe, Tori. You watched that for your quest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was something. Not everything but, uh, was good. <laughs> not everything's they good. To be, um, they seem to be adult oriented but children friendly yeah yeah very much so kind of like uh kind of like disney but did they do three thousand leagues in search for mother that seems like a show that they did i can look that up for you yeah 
That's a one. Hickey, have <laughs> you have you seen anything from Nippon? I might because I watch a bunch of stuff, but I'm not familiar. You probably with them. have. There's a bunch of shows I really need. I really want to watch when I when I get the time to do so. Yeah, it's not a studio. Yes. People, yeah, Jenny, they yes. did. Yeah, so that's yeah. if you if you got a mature kind of kid coming of age story and going through some hardship, you can probably bet that Nippon did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it was. It's definitely a studio that doesn't. That's not very known. I feel today. Probably not, but it's definitely a studio I respect a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of respect, uh, <laughs> we're getting to the late the late 70s now, transitioning to the 80s, and it wouldn't be anything without Studio Sunrise. <laughs> what would the 80s be without Gundam? This is, yeah, so Sunrise did Gundam, every, just about every mech show you can possibly imagine. <laughs> <laughs> All um, the good ones. Code, Code Geass, Geass, Code Geass, 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 Geass and, Bebop. and oh, yeah. Gintama. Gintama. It's kind of, kind of a new World one. Live. Inuyasha, Alto Star. <laughs> Planets. <laughs> oh, yeah, they did yeah. Planet Live. <laughs> uh, yeah, so in the, in the 80s, the 80s were times where it was either comedy or mech. That seemed to be the thing. And to see Sunrise somehow go from Gundam, 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 mech, 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 to now just this weird parody kind of company. <laughs> <laughs> it's very odd uh, I, I'll be honest I, I'm a huge Gun- Sunrise fan um, basically anything they put out I will watch now will I like it that's a different story but it's, I, gener- it's I, generally it's got a good percentage on, on what I like from them and who works there <laughs> okay I'm essentially the opposite anything that doesn't have Universal Century tagged onto it or um, uh, Nietzsche Bros I basically don't like. I mean, I liked Big O, but that was basically the outlier in the situation. Tori, mm-hmm. so me yeah, basically. Uh, well, Sunrise for me is like I'm. You know, you know me. I'm not a big fan of Mac, so yeah. Sunrise is one of those studios for me that I'm like. And then when I see them put out another Mac show, whether it be Gundam or anything else, I, I don't really care. It's not my thing. No, so granted, they do have stuff that I like, Cowboy Bebop. We can also say that that is technically made by Bones, but we can get into that later. Uh, (laughs) You love me some Studio uh, Bones. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, like, it's one of those things where I feel like Sunrise for me kind of sits very, like, nicely at this, like, average to slightly above average studio. It's like, it's got stuff that I like, but I'm not going to go out of my way to watch a Sunrise show. Yeah, well, that's kind of the problem. It's so heavily typecast. It falls into that big time typecast. Yeah. Yeah, Senpai, you're right. <laughs> but they did Dirty yeah. Pair and Votomes. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Again, they did do good stuff. <laughs> they did Planet this as well. Oh yeah, they did. Yeah, they're in space quite a bit, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's easy to draw black backgrounds with dots. <laughs> oh yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> that art style's amazing. Sometimes there's some dust on the screen as well. Some debris. Okay. That's actually on the cell. It's not on the screen. Shut <laughs> up. I know. <laughs> I know. But it's there. It's there. It's moving with the cell. Yeah. Early sunrise. I really love them. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I think every single show. Not every single show. But most of the shows. They, they, pull, they pull out. They're interesting. Uh, it's not that I really like what they do, but at, still, they manage to make things interesting. I think if only if something I can say about the shows they do is they are highly interesting. You don't need to like it, but I don't think you'd be bored watching a, a <laughs> Sunrise show. I think Sunrise is such a large studio that you would be remiss to call yourself an anime fan and not know who they are. <laughs> You definitely have been into anime very long, if you say that. <laughs> it's a bold statement. <laughs> oh, it's... If you don't at least know who Sunrise is, you haven't really been here this long. So bold. <laughs> I'll hang on to it, too. <laughs> oh, you don't know Gundam? Mm-hmm. Well, what do you mean? <laughs> so the 80s was primarily Sunrise. That was the heavy hitter. Just like Toei was in the, in the 70s. Uh, 
Now, as I mentioned before, it was either mech or comedy. Now, these next two studios, and I'm sorry, I'm, I missed one of them in the agenda here, uh, but I'll say them both. First is Studio Dean, Ranma One Half, mm-hmm. Kono Suba, and Higurashi. Okay, so we okay. kind. Of, Wait, are we talking about comedy? Well, Ranma One Half was <laughs> the '80s. <laughs> I remember I'm saying like three shows people might have heard of. Yeah, but Rama One Half was definitely in the '80s. Okay, I was like, I mean, I was I was laughing my ass off. <laughs> I, I think I was, was supposed to. <laughs> was, was I supposed to laugh at all the death and murder? <laughs> yes, you were. Uh, and then the other studio is Studio Perro. Uh and Piero. they Perro, Perro, <laughs> Piero, <laughs> Parrot. <laughs> Piero. They they've done such shows Piero. as I don't know Piero. if you've heard of these, but Naruto, Bleach, Yu Yu Hakusho. Never heard of a completely shows. unknown studio. Okay. <laughs> They're the ones that kind of took over uh, where Toei was strong in the Shonen Jump se- sector. And they kind of got... They competed in that whole Shonen market in the early mid-2000s. And they got their start in the 80s doing shows here or there along with Studio Dean really behind Sunrise. So they were in kind of that TMS and Nippon situation where they were just trying to do other shows. Thoughts? Uh, I think Studio Dean is kind of one of those studios that just fell from grace way too late because they've, like, from what I remember of Dean, they were an early 2000s, like, killer studio. Just loaded with killers all the time. And then Fate stay night the original dean mix came out and that was just bad they tried to adapt all the roots and i'm not gonna make this a fate talk even though you and you and i are tight moonies mm. <laughs> but we're gonna let that go but that seems to put them on a course to kind of be seen negatively and then here recently they uh dropped show again roku rakugo shinju and it seems to put them back on track to where they should be because honestly they're a very good studio they have the talent behind it. Um, what I've noticed yeah. is they they're definitely they've definitely s- seem to be stuck in the past with a lot yeah. of their art styles and the way they they go about their business. Um, take Konosuba. Okay, Konosuba. it's all there. Is the animation quality all there? Not all the JD, time. JD, JD, JD. I'm gonna have to stop you right there. Okay. You're wrong. You're oh, fucking wrong it. about that. Here we the go. The animation in Konosuba is amazing. Uh, sometimes. No, the not art sometimes. Yeah. The, art, you're ta- the art you're drops talking the ball. About, no, it, you're it talking is. about the stretch and pull thing. However, that is classic Disney animation. Don't even at me there. All right. <laughs> I do love me some smear frames. <laughs> and there's a lot of that in Konosuba. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I love Trigger. They're so into Disney animation. They just love smear frames everywhere. You can see it in Little Witch that you just watched and loved. I did. I'm not saying I don't hate the way what Konosuba does, but it, it just reminds me of the past. It looks well, weird. Def- it definitely does. Can... I do will agree with that. But the, the, the actual animation, the movement, the way stuff works, there is not much to, to like critique them on Keep there. Keep talking, guys. <laughs> okay. It seems, like, it seems like he's kind of falling into one of the, um, one of the normal things to kind of fall into where he's mixing up art style and animation yeah and then and it kind of it kind of goes into that I, thing where it's like i what i often see is people like when they want to critique animation they want to critique like does the character stay on model technically that doesn't matter in animation they don't have to stay on model there is no does it look uh, fine in movement who cares yeah right and that's kind of actually if you look up there is a book on animation i know right uh but there's an actual book in animation and if there is one thing that says what like when it comes to the rules of animation they usually consider loose and fluid better because it works better with the movement of 2d animation when you get absolutely when it's like on if you try to always keep it on model and it can end up not always of course people can do it very well but it can end up looking very stiff and lifeless that's why you see oftentimes you see shows that like yeah. they okay. incorporate CG into their models to try to make sure that the like uh, drawings stay it's... on uh, like uh, on model, and they oftentimes just seem incredibly robotic. Well, that's kind of why um, Mob Psycho 100 was so amazing 
it yeah. took so many different art styles, smashed them all together, and worked perfectly. Guys. Yes. Guys. Yes. yes. Guys. Can we talk about Studio sure. Dean? Uh, oh. Studio <laughs> Dean did Angel's Egg, and I you love know, that just, uh, Same. <laughs> I love movies that don't talk and make me think about yeah. things the entire time. Yeah. Uh, they they did a lot of really good. I mean, I know one of the guys in the Discord loves Sankarea. I'm not sure if he loves the series or the manga more. They also did a. Uh, they did the Kenshin OVAs. Kenshin. And oh yes! Oh, that Samurai early X. trust and betrayal. That early trust and betrayal. That is just yes. That. I mean, it's one of those where it's like, that was kind of one of my early like experiences with old quote unquote old anime animation and old anime and it was like it was kind of when i still had this like concept of old anime tends to look worse and then i just get into uh get into like uh, trust and betrayal and just look at that and i'm like yeah. is this really and i'm like i don't didn't have a good relationship with studio dean at the time so i'm just like especially coming off of fate and i look at like even the way they animate hair movement they animated individual hair straws and i'm like is this really dean I have, did I did I mistake them for someone? <laughs> they know exactly what makes them money. Yeah. Well, we seem to be talking about like really popular studios while this is going on, but uh, since we have the time here, I want to talk about something kind of middle of the road. Like yeah. have, you know, Log Horizons, the Studio Dean show. Yeah, we have a uh, Dragon Crisis, so kind of like their middle of the road shows because their amazing shows are amazing, but every studio's amazing shows are usually pretty uh, fucking amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Hey guys, I'm back. We... <laughs> hey. Well, welcome back. I'm glad you got that phone call. Thanks yeah. for muting your phone, like I asked before this started. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> could you guys hear me the whole time? <laughs> no. Um, some of it, you might want to cut that out. Uh, All right, no problem. Anyway, we yeah. have we have Dragon Crisis, which is a uh, a series that looks fine. It looks fine in movement, but the writing is just fucking shit, in <laughs> my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, you have something. You know, something like Log Horizon, which the writing was strong, the character models were great, the animation was fine, but for some reason it all fell flat. And I think that was just because they spent too long on exposition, which I'm not going to get into you with exposition creators. <laughs> but <laughs> That's Studio ultimately, <laughs> um, well, yeah, but ultimately, garbage. It seems like it seems like they got too caught up in world building to actually build the world in any real way that you're supposed to care about. So I'm not sure if that's exactly on them or the writers or any of that, but it is a work that they did that that issue came up in. Yeah. Well then. <laughs> Hickey, you want it? Next up, we got Piho. Anyone have anything to say Piro? about this, sir? Didn't we, didn't we already he, talk yep. about Piero? I mean, we, I guess we only touched on it. We mentioned, I, I, no. I think Dean and Piero have a lot, in, lot in common, uh, yeah. with the exception of Piero going more sh towards shonen. Uh, yeah, like you said, Bleach, Naruto, yeah. Yu Hakusho. <laughs> but especially in the 80s, they, 80s and 90s, they had a lot in common. Yeah, um, GTO, which was great. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going into the 90s. <laughs> 90s. Everyone's favorite time, right? 9x. And by the way, the, that was the bank mind. calling me earlier. <laughs> so I kind of had to take no, that. No, I know exactly uh, what it was. <laughs> I don't remember a lot. So what are we talking about in the 90s, JD? So we got one of my favorite studios and one of your favorite studios. And not which mine. is Gynax and JC Staff. I like Gynax a lot. So there That's was, why I like Trigger so much. Yeah, they're, they're, the 90s was I interesting. Wonder why. <laughs> it was, imagine all the studios we've talked about prior all coming together at one time now in the 90s. Now we've added Gynax to the mix. <laughs> Gynax was Madhouse before Madhouse was Madhouse. And what Gynax has done is Gurren Lagan, uh, some Evangelion show, and yeah. uh, Gunbuster, which we've covered on this podcast. Mm -hmm. And JC Check staff out. <laughs> went a totally different route than that, you might say. They've done things like Revolutionary Girl Utena, Toradora... Uh, the more relevant food wars. More relevant. <laughs> should have stayed among them. Well, I mean, <laughs> food wars is going. Food, uh, food wars is going into a third season, so I'm sure a lot. I mean, there's a lot of fans out there. It's it, you definitely see a different trend coming here now. To all the fans of Toradora or not Toradora, uh, food wars. I suggest you just read the manga. 
Yeah, you're basically getting the manga anyways. You're basically watching the manga, but yeah. way slower. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Doesn't that mean it's good, then? Voice acted. The first uh, season was it, good. It does if you like it, but if if you're looking for anything else, I mean, you, you're better off just reading it. You'll get it faster, and I think it's a better format, personally. Yeah. Okay. But I like manga, so... I mean, I don't know what to really say about that. So, what did these two studios do differently that separated them from the, t- the pack? Because during the 90s, there weren't a lot of studios cropping up, I, I, just from my observation. Gainax, I like to say, um, well, this is obviously false, but they stopped caring. <laughs> they did exactly what they wanted to do pretty often, and it seems like every time they did that, they got another hit series. Neon Genesis Evangelion... Fooly Cooly, Gurren Lagan. They had, um, well, you might know a little series we called Kari Kano that we reviewed last episode. Wasn't mm. exactly everyone's favorite. Uh, um, at least. <laughs> Gunbuster, which anytime they just threw the rule book <laughs> out the window and did what they did best, which is animate, have Ano go fucking nuts and try to kill himself off the top of the roof, <laughs> but write stories and direct. <laughs> And they had Nadia, <laughs> by the way, which is the other one. Nadia I think the blue we might water, review yeah, that pretty something. soon. Yeah, it's yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, it's they've kind of fell from grace now after uh, they all split and started forming Studio Kara, Studio Trigger, and then a couple stragglers went to other studios. But for the most part, they went to Kara or they went to Trigger. So nowadays, you can't see Gainax in its true form with new things. But if you go back to the '90s and the early 2000s, you see. Gynax how they should have been how they should always be and to be honest with you I love this decade of Gynax they're hands down my favorite studio of all time but I'm gonna have to follow Trigger from now on well it's funny you bring, you bring up Kari Kano because JC staff actually helped out on that show yeah uh, I'm not yep. really sure what they did exactly I think they but... did some in betweening for it yeah well in between of what manga panels I don't know <laughs> yeah, well, but it definitely it definitely credited, fits their so... style. It definitely fits their <laughs> their their shoujo esque style that they they went for. Mm-hmm. Um, they they have this artistic feel to them. Am I am I being presumptive in in saying that? No, I don't think so. You know, it's always like flowers coming across the screen, uh, glitter plant explosions. They're pretty good at doing shit like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. You know, Every embracing the tropes and doing something a little bit more with them. I've noticed. Yeah. Uh, maybe even getting, maybe even getting a little bit more mm. mature, which we don't see from a lot of shows. Uh, they they've done one of my one of my favorites, uh, Honey and Clover. Well, I, d- I do feel that uh, Gynax and JC Staff kind of split up, and JC Staff was well. I'm I'm not literally talking about splitting up, but I feel like JC Staff was more of the uh, Jose Shojo side of the '90s. Whereas Gainax took more of the the seinen kind of shonen like side of the coin. Shonen robots. <laughs> well, robots are as shonen as it gets. Who doesn't love a good robot fist fight? I don't. Well, you're a piece of shit, Tori. Anyway. <laughs> no, come on. You're a terrible person. You should feel bad. <laughs> That's right. Your taste is garbage just like your wife. Hey. <laughs> Too low. What oh, the wow. hell? He threw oh, the I'll rifle kick you in, in the, the middle. Shins until oh, you damn. Fall over dead. <laughs> <laughs> it was fighting words. What are we talking about, oh, studios? <laughs> so back to studios. So back to studios. Yeah, it's 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 interesting to see that what a studio had to do, because um, you didn't see a lot. You see, you saw maybe two or three make a name for themselves, but doing something different of the time from what the powerhouse studio was doing. And in the '90s, I feel like. There was no single powerhouse studio, but it was all the ones from the 70s and 80s now, kind of on equal terms. Well, I feel like we left one studio out of the 90s. All right, what would that be? Production IG. Uh, I would Ghost in the Shell, Eden of the East, Kimi Ni Todoke, Kuroko no Basuke, that, that helped with Neon Genesis came, Evangelion. But those shows came later. Uh, Ava, Fooly, they, they're making the new Fooly Cooly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they, uh, I see, Jay, you, have, I, I, you <laughs> have them set for 2000, so I guess. Yeah, because even though some of the studios that we're going to mention 
I feel just on a personal level they 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 weren't really known yet. They hadn't done say let's call it a hit show quite yet. I mean, they did Ghost in the Shell. Well, they did the movie Ghost in the Shell. Yeah, that 95. was that yeah, was their thing. I, I would call you that. You could also hit. argue like Madhouse <laughs> had a, a couple. <laughs> you could argue Madhouse had a couple hits back then, a but they weren't hit. really a primetime player yet. You might. Say. I mean, they helped with uh, EOE. That uh, Triple X Hawk was in the nineties. Yeah, I guess you can put them in the two thousands. I'll talk about them when we get yeah. there. Yeah, because they're they're one of they're is, one of the studios I, I definitely the will mention. Oh, and they did Cromarty High. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of the two thousands, it's a madhouse time. Madhouse. <laughs> now, in the middle of the what street. happened in the late nineties, early two thousands? To have Madhouse command so much authority, they adopted guy, well, uh, guy Nexus philosophy. <laughs> yeah, they they just stopped giving a shit. Yeah. <laughs> they became new guy Because this but. is this is you know whether what they did just about every show you can imagine. You could you could Google anime two thousands uh, to two thousand six. Mo- more than likely, it's going to be a madhouse show before anything else. <laughs> yeah, I think that's they kind of gave the the step ahead when you know uh, every single time uh, every single time we have a stagnation on studios, and then mm-hmm. like in anime and anime manga light novels visual novels, you have a stagnation. It's and just then someone stopped. hits. Then someone takes that step ahead like a one step that changed it all and in the 2000s it was Madhouse Madhouse just came up with I don't know I I can talk about that but they if they got so many shows that's because they had a new kind of uh, company model or uh, market model that kind of separate them from the pack and they just got better <laughs> they they definitely hit a stride um to say the least and then they fell hard they're still falling even though they're still they falling w- they had one thing in the early 2000s it's too, it's too no, uh, but that's that, it's uh, satoshi kon yeah satoshi kon that is the death of Satoshi Kon is probably the biggest, blo- one of the biggest blows Madhouse has had. Yeah, I mean, once that's once... like if Gainax just lost Ano, which is what happened, and then they fell. Yeah, it's basically the same thing. Yeah, and then you have yeah. like the the same as like the, the founders of Madhouse. Two of the founders of Madhouse they started leaving because they were like, you have you know the one guy I don't remember now which one of them. It's like he went and started. Well, technically, Mappa was already a thing, but it was, Mappa work was under Madhouse, but he kind of took Mappa and left. Like, it's like this is mine now, and I don't want to be a part of this. And a lot of that happened because Madhouse eventually reached that stage where it got so big that the like the creative people of Madhouse they weren't allowed to be creative anymore. They just had to essentially accept they stuff. It. Yeah. So then, it eventually, what eventually happened was people said, "Enough of this. I'm leaving. I'm taking Mappa, and I'm going there." Other people go, "I'm starting Studio Volan." You even have a new studio now, Studio Nut, which is founded by people leaving Madhouse. It's like people are just. They're, they don't want and to it wasn't Madhouse just <laughs> and it wasn't just Studio Madhouse. This was happening to this was happening to Sunrise, Toei, TMS. A yeah. bunch of studios were starting to lose. I'm so glad Sunrise got cut down into bones. Yeah, well, <laughs> this is what. So this is where I'm going. Oh, I'm so. So glad. <laughs> around that 2004 mark is where we have Studio Bones Production IG, and then. Out of nowhere, seemingly Kyoto Animation hit something, and they hit some. They hit a gold mine of something, <laughs> and it wasn't. Yeah, key shows. Key shows. <laughs> they hit, luckily, luckily for them. Key shows. But Bones IG, and then around the 2007 mark, after that 2005 lull, because that was the peak of what they call the uh, the the height of anime, is when the you bubble. had. The, the bubble bursted, the bubble. and that's when you started getting a plethora of of small studios uh, erupting, and two studios of note in that time was Shaft and A1 Pictures finally got their shows to come, come into their own. So we now have five studios, new, 
competing with all the ones that we've mentioned now. We have IG, Bones, Kyoto, Shaft, and A1. To be fair, Shaft has been around since when, Tori? The 80s? Uh, yeah, Shaft's been around for a long time. But they were essentially Shaft... in yeah, between but... studio at that point. Right. Not even in between studio. They did stuff, but they did, like, they put out shows, like, I think they were, like, I think they put out one show in the 80s, and then the next show came out in the 90s. They did next to nothing. And then all of a sudden, come 2000, bang, they start exploding. Show yeah. after show as after show after show. As soon as that bubble show. bursted, all these people saw it as an opportunity. It's like, oh, look, Madhouse is no longer on top. Now's our chance to shine and make like, a oh, ton look, of money. Oh, look, we can be the next insert studio here. Right. Here. So, like, I think the bubble is a, a important point in the lifetime of all those studios because we saw some kind of uh some kind of product uh, production methods to arise for example you have a lot of insiders a lot of a bunch of studios stop uh, bringing on a bunch of uh freelancers to to work for them which is the case of PA works P works tries to strives to not get freelancers mm-hmm. You know, only get in-house animators. But then, in the other side, you have A1 Pictures, which the way to survive was let's just get a bunch of freelancers and basically just take the money, give them the money, and not in, not get ourselves involved with the the, the production. Yeah, per I was under the assumption all. that PA Works entire uh, those... look, quote unquote, was based on one of the freelancers that they keep hiring. Uh, well, he's not he's not so much a freelancer, but he's a friend of the uh, president of uh, PA Works, which is why he helps them out a lot. And they kind it's, of this yeah. is where I feel like it's important to like recognize the connections, like how important connections are in anime, because PA Works essentially became the studio that they are now due to connections, because the president has a lot of connections. I mean, it's why you see such as uh, which I show you, you should watch Senpai. Uh, the eccentric family <laughs> where it's like one of the things that kind of stood out in the first season was that all of a sudden they get mad like madhouse vet- veteran like Toshiyuki Inoue to do to animate cuts for them again why he doesn't work for them well it happens because he knows the president he is friends with the pres- uh, president of uh, PA works so it's like they kind of they managed to get these huge names in the industry to help out at at times, but as he says, essentially PA Works' business model is to try to not have freelancers. But I feel like they have this weird uh, PA Works has this like weird like standstill uh, kind of business model as well, where it's, where it's they want everyone to progress. Nobody should work the same job more than two years, which is why they kind of have uh, this like you know Bones mentality in betweeners. They should be within two years. They should be key animators. Right, so it's like they end up fire or not even firing. They end up starting to tax their w- workers a lot because, quite frankly, most people aren't going to take the step from in betweener up to key animator, especially not within two years. And what does it matter if you if everybody became a key animator? You need in betweeners. You cannot make anime without <laughs> in betweeners in today's <laughs> in the way stuff works now. Well, well PA works. No. I like to. No, not no, yet. They they're working on a way to do that, but they can't actually implement it yet. Yeah, they're working on a on a yeah. bot to do but it. But it, it yes. does. It's not viable <laughs> like, yet. Well... It still looks pretty bad. PA works. I like to describe in the same way that uh, Canapa. <laughs> that's uh, the Canapa effect. I suggest checking his channel out on YouTube. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's the same way Canapa uh, describes UFO table. And please don't say ufotable because that's UFO table you it's about a table you foldable <laughs> yeah don't say that <laughs> anyway his uh his philosophy is we don't outsource until we get fucked yeah <laughs> and that seems to be the same thing pa works does yeah. kind of well it's it's funny you guys bring up pa because like, they were kind of this turn even more in the industry uh like tori said it's it's all about their connections mm. and this is also where we started seeing Kind of even more studios kind of come come into their own, and that was UFO Table, the Polygon Pictures, Studio Wit or Wit Studio. Well, that's just yeah. IG. Wit Studio is yeah, some city area. Brains Base and Trigger. So it's almost like we've seen people break off even more, or studios trying to 
have a separate version of themselves to make a different kind of work to get away from their typecasting. It's usually not even a different kind of work. It's usually they want to continue doing what they want to do. And making a new studio will kind of facilitate them to continue doing the same thing. Yeah. And that leads us to today. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> it is. Now, I just want to say one thing. Now we have too yeah. many studios, it seems. Well, no. I wouldn't say we have too many, but we have a lot. We do have a lot. However, I just want to say one thing in regards to WIT, in regards yeah. to WIT, because, you know, like we said, uh, WIT is a subsidiary of uh, IG. IG has a lot of subsidiaries there. You can find them everywhere. But um, WIT is kind of like the prominent one, especially, you know, when it really blew up when uh, it made uh, Attack on Titan. That was like the big, their big breakout. And uh, um, I think it's Rolling Girls. Okay, yeah, you're right. The hell's a rolling girl? I don't know. What the fuck is a rolling, rolling girl? Rolling girls is really <laughs> no. good. Okay. But well, to be fair, it's pretty. That's not the point I want to make. The point I wanted to make is, it is if it you is know, good. if you know something about well. studios, you will know A1 has a very <laughs> shitty reputation. And I'm talking A1 now. Because A1 has a shitty reputation because it has, it, you know, it has like five people. It, it only has five people working for it that actually works there. And the rest is freelancers. And they kind of have this staple of being, you know, <laughs> the studio that, that the problem in the anime industry. Because they treat their workers pretty poorly. And they do. They are a part of the problem. They're not the only problem. Wit is incredibly similar. And now with the president and other people of Wit Studio coming out and kind of explaining their whole work ethic. When it came to uh, Attack on Titan. You realize that. You realize that. First of all, the president is a workaholic, and he treats his, uh, his employees the same way. This guy is not. This guy is not afraid. Wasn't wasn't he the guy? Yeah, that said, the uh, director. Isn't the guy that said like, "We're gonna wipe the our animators"? <laughs> yeah, or something like that. They were no. It's, it's that, that is the president and the yeah. It's it the president the and the guy. director. Yeah. I think of uh, of uh, the second season of Attack on Titan. I think they're. Those were the two that did the interview. And it's like, they're talking about literally how the animators are so happy for the uh, success of, the, of uh, Attack on Titan, which is understandable. Yet at the same time, they go on to talk about the, um, like, they go on to talk about how they were literally living off of fucking energy bars and energy drinks for weeks, not sleeping, not going home, working. And at the, it, this makes sense because this is the same period in time where Wit was on Twitter begging for people to come and apply to work for them because everyone quit. Animators dropped out left, right, and center because they couldn't handle it anymore. <laughs> it was either you can't handle it or you literally die at work. Yeah. I and mean, that's this is, not even a joke. Yeah. They, these people will fucking fall over dead at work. Yeah. yeah. And this is so... Japan. People don't quit their job in Japan. That's not normal. You get blacklisted if you start firing people in that fucking country. Like, yeah. there are very serious problems. Meanwhile, you have the exact opposite going on at studios like Trigger. You have the exact opposite. You have literally the opposite going on at, like, Polygon Pictures. Thank you, Yoani. Those are, like, the, those are like the dream locations yeah, to work at. Mean. Those are, like, the places everyone wants to work at because you get, a, you get a wage. That is incredible. You get a decent wage. You have good working conditions. Like, it's like if you talk to anybody in the anime industry... Most of them will say, if you if you ask them, where do you want to work? They'll probably say Kyoto, Kyoto Animation. Most likely. Some people might say some other pe places, but it's like, it's just because they have such good reputations. With yeah, like, Kyoto and Trigger staff. Polygon. Yeah. That's really it. <laughs> the rest of them, you're, you're basically getting work until yeah. you fall I over think... dead or become important enough that you can say no. Yeah. I think, the other thing that I think it's it's important to to mention with the newer studios and how they they are nowadays that those things they aren't only studios they yeah. are brands and I think it is important because how I see the the market is like it's survival you know mm -hmm. it's a jungle it's mm. dirty and if you don't do shit shit right uh, yeah. you're done you're you're right we... so like you have UFO Table Cafe <laughs> for example you have PA, uh, PA Works as restaurants as well. They have all those, all the business they start sprouting 
with the brand and they have a fan base they can you know have more money to do their stuff and make originals i don't know what they do with their money probably nothing <laughs> they don't have money to spend everything goes uh they don't they can't they can't hold any money but anyway you have that kind of stuff you have uh for example pa works helps to develop cities i think that's very important i think uh that shows uh from the 70s from the, uh, the 60s with uh tezuka productions from nowadays how they grew up not only you know we talk about uh, we are we talk about anime being part of the culture uh the pop culture how it helps to to mm -hmm. develop things but the studios they are also part of it and that's yeah. very important uh going to the future something that i i realized a, a little uh, a while ago is that the should uh like you guys said they uh some animators they are uh, making studios to be able to do what they want to do and one thing that i i realized that more and more we see studios striving to achieve a uniqueness to the adaptation you have shaft you have polygon you have ufo tape you have trigger they are very unique they're very stylish uh, and i think this is something this is the next step on the evolution you're gonna have more and more unique look a more unique look to the to the anime well, ironically the studios you just talked about are the exact studios i would watch literally anything that came out by them yeah anything shaft produces <clears throat> yeah, because... anything that trigger touches <laughs> but, yeah like there's no other studio that made me care about a trap a bunch of children some words on the screen a harem series another harem series like, there's no other studio besides chef that made me care about those things so I will watch anything they touch same thing goes for Trigger even though I didn't like Kill a Kill I knew exactly what kind of studio they were because of where they all came from yeah what I want to talk about as well is I want to I just want to touch on this like little interesting thing which and especially, I know you know about this, and you know, with Trigger and whatnot. But when we see these studios, more and more studios, you know, popping up, we also see this interesting thing, which especially, you know, I'm very interested to see how Trigger and the other studios in this does. And that is the, like, how studios will form bonds, and especially studios such as Polygon Pictures and Trigger and a bunch of other uh, I'm gonna see if I can actually pull it up Trigger and Production see. IG are coming out with something yeah but it's I'm not it's no uh, but it does, that doesn't really matter much because the people from Trigger are from Gainax yeah the people from Gainax had very close connections to Production IG so that was well, already no, bond that they had yeah but what I'm it's, talking it's please go Tori what I'm talking about is the uh, especially in this case Ultra Super Pictures yeah, well, no, this is, uh, I guess it's some studios wrong, but it's like studios like uh, Sons Again, or that Trigger and Leighton Films. And this is essentially a collaboration. It started out, it was started out as being like, uh, kind of like uh, the uh, Nippon thing. Uh, I've, I've well, what, what they World wanted originally was to make a, uh, a bidding chip so that they could get whatever they wanted put on TV. Yeah, essentially. It was an animation block, kind of like what uh, World Masterpiece Theater for Nippon Animation was way back in the 70s. This is kind of, we're seeing like kind of the rise of that again, which I find kind of interesting. How you will now see more studios kind of come together and form quote unquote alliances to kind of try to st strengthen their own like standings in the industry. And I think Trigger well, has done a very good job <laughs> of, uh, as well, especially considering the fact that they managed to get and reach out to studios such as Polygon Pictures, which are huge internationally. And get well, while we're talking about um, Ultra Super Pictures, I'll just tell you guys some things that they've had direct, like, hands-on. They've done Arpeggio of Blue Steel, uh, Berserk 2016, what a shit show that was, Black mm. Rock Shooter, <laughs> Kill a Kill, that doesn't exist. Kill a Kill, Kizniver, Little Witch, uh, they did Terraformars, or Terraformers, whatever you want to call it, yeah. and then uh, Yamada-kun and the Seven Witches. Now, some of those are kind of like shows I didn't care for. Like, I didn't like Kill a Kill that much, even though I'm a huge Trigger fanboy now. Go figure. And then Yamada-kun, after I read the manga, I couldn't see the anime the same. And same thing goes for Arpeggio of Blue Steel. 
but I don't think those things would have even got a time slot if it wasn't for this collaboration of studios. Yeah. Any final thoughts? Um, not exactly. I mean, I'm I, I a, I pray I'm that. a pretty... I'm not exactly super fond of where anime is going right now, to be honest with you. I don't really like this kind of um, moeification, where they kind of just make everything kind of nothing in my eyes. That goes into our fluff discussion from a previous podcast we did. Yeah, That's true, but I mean, I don't <laughs> like the kind of nothing we're going into right now, but these studios, you know, Shaft, Trigger, um, UFO Table, Polygon, or so I need to talk about Polygon, but we'll save that for later. But anyway, these studios, I like that they're kind of being different than everyone else. I really appreciate that they're studios that are going out of their way to do what they want to do. It's kind of refreshing for me that these studios are just doing whatever they want to do, as opposed to studios that I think are kind of just doing exactly, like they're towing their own line. They're doing exactly what's going to make them money. And making money is great. Don't get me wrong. I love mm-hmm. I love making money. <laughs> but at oh, the same all. time... What a sellout. As an, an, <laughs> as an anime fan for over 20 years at this point, I can't, I can't look at a show like... I'll throw Kyo any on the bus. I can't look at Kaon. I can't look at Clanon. I can't... I just don't care about these series. They, I feel like they're kind of nothing. As opposed to series like Kill a Kill, which I didn't like, but I totally understood the entire time. I got why people like it. I understand what it's about. I, I understand where the writing comes from. It's just not for me, and I feel more connected to a series that I know isn't for me, but is still well written, still well put together, as opposed to a series where I think is kind of phoned in. I felt the, I felt the same way uh-huh. with something like Eccentric Family. Not to say that QNE phones anything in, because I know they don't. I know they try very hard for everything they do, but they're so opposite of my style that I can't I can't even really understand why people like them. Like I know ex- I know exactly why, but I don't understand why. And that's <laughs> kind of my problem with where modern anime is going. I've been so the other side of what's popular right now that I can't see the flip side of my argument. Yeah. And that's basically where I sit. <laughs> I'm kind of a I'm kind of in a similar situation myself. Stick with me. You know, what 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 used to be popular in the 90s is not popular now. It's so incredibly not popular that it's actually the opposite. Yeah. yeah. No, I can feel uh, certain similarities there. Uh, I'm not against necessarily against where the anime industry go is going because I'm like in this weird spot where it's like uh, I've said this before but I kind of I got started like four years ago of watching anime, but except I kind of got started like watching '90s anime and then moved out into the more. So I'm like kind of stuck. It's like a part of me wants like '90s, but that part of me is okay with where stuff goes and where it is now. And it's like so I'm in this weird spot. We'll get However, we'll get you to the cult side soon enough. Completely, to, I'm kind of to doing steal it. a quote from another podcast for you, Tori. You're the most knowledgeable newest fan <laughs> I've ever talked to. Well, thanks for that. And that's and it's not even close. <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, I try. No, but uh, what I like though, and this is this goes <laughs> really really weird, right? But what I'm probably the mo- the thing that I'm most interested in, I'm most excited for with the anime industry right now, in seeing where it goes forward, is seeing where it goes forward from a business perspective. Because I'm interested to see how what anime will do, like keep staying relevant, because it's becoming more and more popular, even worldwide now. So it's like. How, what are they going to do to keep to stay relevant? And it's like, are we going to see like studios kind of start merging back together? Or are we going to see people like looking back to the 70s or stuff like that? And kind of we start to see them do stuff more similar now that they did back then? Or are they going to go in a completely different direction? What's going to happen with like Kiyoani, for example, which seems to be wanting to dabble in stream in like their own streaming service and stuff like that? And it's like stuff like that interests me. I'm not necessarily Authority. hopeful for the an- for like for shows that not necessarily like I think anime going forward is going to bring out a bunch of shows that I personally will enjoy, but I'm interested in it from like a business perspective to see how the anime industry will evolve. I could Authority, see you I- and I have talked about this for a while, but I think this will start a good discussion with us. Um, what do you think the strongest studio will be going forward? 
for instance, for me, I think it's going to be Studio Trigger because of their relation to Studio Kara and Studio Kara's involvement in the Young Animator Project. Yeah. I mean, I kind of they have on ties it. to every because these people are getting so these animators are getting either old, retiring, falling out, going into directorial roles. All the master class animators besides Nakamura, who is tied down to bones for his entire life, <laughs> <laughs> they'll never let go of that guy. <laughs> are kind of just going into different roles. Yeah. So I think these having this tie to the Young Animator Festival, having this tie to these shorts, giving this great really working relationship with Studio Kara because of what happened with Gainax. I think that Trigger going forward will be the strongest studio because of all that and because they're entirely founded on creative principles. They're entirely founded on doing what you want to do as opposed to a studio like Polygon Pictures, which is already incredibly famous. Mm -hmm. They're already very good at what they do. And with like the release of... uh, Blam, they did Knights of Sidonia. Please, please, God, please, please, God, do Bio Omega into the movie. Uh, they can go far, but there's no creativity left in that studio. They're so by the book exactly how the manga, the light novel, whatever they adapt is, that I don't know if their creators are creative enough to make something their own. I could see I could see a couple studios uh, such as the Madhouse or Toei, um, even a Sunrise, take people from this developing project and work for them because money talks. They do, but money talks. I mean, but connections are very strong in this industry. They are, but uh, connections is what drives this. But sure, I mean, but you put enough zeros. You put enough zeros on that check. Well, yeah, but they're, you're not, they're not going to do that. <laughs> That's kind of how we're the administration now. They're not really going to do that. I, I don't think so. But, like, what I think is, and you kind of have, I understand, and I agree with you, Senpai, in, the, um, in that Trigger is probably a studio, is definitely a studio to look, for, uh, look out for. I think they're going to do great going forward. Um, the problem, like, the problem is, but it's not even a problem, actually. Uh, I don't know why I call it a problem. The thing is, it's like you look at Polygon. What can what can a studio like Polygon offer that no, not many, very many other studios can? Job security, and I think that's going to be a huge thing going forward. So it's like it they are definitely huge issue. yeah right, and so it's like people are definitely going to be looking to them. And I like what they do because first of all, they have a great businessman as a president, businessman, not a creator, a businessman. He really knows what, what he's doing. So it's like, I feel like that's going to give them a very big advantage right now. However, what I think, I don't think it's going to matter that much in the, in the now because studios like Polygon Pictures, they do have their ties to, uh, to Trigger at the moment. And I feel like, it, especially now, I don't know how long through, uh, like, um, uh, what's it called? <laughs> Ultra Super Pictures is going to last. But as long as well, this they're tie... all in the same building, so it's going to be pretty yeah. difficult to break them up. Exactly, right? And it's like, as long as this tie is still active, I feel like these these studios are pretty much going to grow simultaneously, more or less, because they're right now they're they're collaborating essentially on a lot that's of stuff. That's not a crazy. That's not a crazy thing to think. And um, just for the sake of brevity, I just want to ask if anyone else has anything else to do before we start, mo- or anything else to say before we start moving on. Uh, <laughs> just because we do have to talk about these shorts, and these shorts ain't exactly gonna be so uh, short in our in our talks. I think we're gonna pretty heavily disagree on some of these. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I, I know I will. Maybe. <laughs> Everyone. Yeah. Good? Well, yeah. Um, Hickey, what you got? Anything? Yep. No, I already kind of made my my conclusion. <laughs> I would say QNE is the <laughs> will be the strongest anime, uh, anime studio going on, especially because they are going to try a new kind of business uh, uh, business you know, model. To be fair, we might just make a um, a shorter form podcast of this entire topic. I probably should have just made this a topic in the beginning because we could talk about this for hours. Yeah, I know at least Tori and myself could, yeah. and I'm sure you guys could throw in because you've been watching long enough to understand what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. No, I mean you guys make great points. Uh, I can't really argue. Um, 
I honestly, I honestly do think that the bigger studios will stay relevant and take a lot of the talent away from the smaller ones. I, I honestly think the... don't think Toei and Sunrise will ever have an issue. At least <laughs> not for a very long time. Not for not yeah. for quite some time, but I could I could definitely see them going. You know what? I mean, Madhouse is kind of crumbling, but Mad- they're building yeah. right now. Toei Toei but... is technically having problems right now, but it's not problems enough to actually have any real. <laughs> Toei meaning. also produces One Piece. Yeah, I could easily I could see. Uh, what I want to what I want to last put is just just I could totally see some big person coming up from Trigger, and uh, his contract's about to expire, and Toei just says, "Hey, some free reigns on a show." Give you enough zeros on this check. <laughs> well, the problem is Toei is a much harsher work environment than Trigger. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing like he'll freelance for him. I like, don't know. You get a young enough. You get a no, young enough kid. Sees yeah, but, sees the sees the, the mighty dollar JD, again. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm just gonna say this. I pretty much think what's gonna happen in that kid is he's gonna say yes. I will work with you on this project. And they will will help them out on that, and then he will be right back. Because the problem is, I don't see this changing very much, because this is just a Japanese mentality. You're loyal. You tend to stay loyal to the people that bring you up. Times are changing, Tori. They not are. In Japan. <laughs> they are, but not in Japan, yeah. The only exception to that really... I know Japan, it really, takes a lot longer, that's for the sure. Only, the only exception to that, really, that I can think of right off the top of my head is Yoyo Shinori. Because he was brought up by Madhouse, or he got his first job at Madhouse. However, he wanted to work for Gynax. So when Gynax all of a sudden... Believe. When Gynax all of a sudden oh. managed to fi- figure out that he had applied to them, and they were like, wow, how didn't we know this? They decided to give him a job, and he decided decided to tell a lie to Madhouse, where he said he would, being an animator was too hard for him, so he was going to quit the industry. And then a couple of months later, he's working at Gynax. <laughs> That's like the uh. only example I can think of of somebody actually forsaking the company, bringing them up in for something else. However, the Oceanari brothers have also never been your common people. <laughs> well, how about we move on to Hickey's summer update on the anime season? Yeah. I know you guys are excited about this. It's been shorter because, yeah, we talked so much about the studios that I really need to wrap <laughs> up everything. Uh I won't talk much. Don't worry about it. I'm not here, like uh, Giguk would say. I'm not here watching everything, all of that shit. So you don't need to watch you. <laughs> I'm watching everything because I'm batshit crazy, and I don't really care about what are you guys watching. I think uh, uh, starting up, I'll I'll just say some shows that mm-hmm. caught my attention. First of all, everyone, I think everyone here is watching yeah. is Kakegurui. <laughs> It's just amazing. <laughs> oh, I read them. The the manga, I can testify, it is good. And Jabami just gets on my <laughs> good side. It's just... Uh, uh, what a woman. <laughs> uh, but instead of... I, I guess of instead of going through every single show people are watching, which would basically be Ballroom, uh, Token Rambo, Kakegurui... I'll uh, we'll go to some of the shows that kind of caught out my attention, and I don't think mo- a lot of people are watching yeah. them. We're gonna have uh, Shokaku no Altair. It's not drawing itself to be a really, uh, really good show, but the uh, the story is very interesting. First of all, it's on old Turkey. It's like Turkey against French <laughs> or something. <laughs> it's very interesting. It's something you don't see very much. Oh, is much that the in, like in Catholic anime. show with church no. people fighting? No, it's no, not. the Catholic show. It is. It is also a oh, very great show, <laughs> which is Vatkan Kiseki Chosakan. The first two episodes we had Vatkan, uh, high tech priests, some satanic shit, and people dying. I was laughing the entire time. It was amazing. <laughs> I really had a good time. A really, really good time watching it. Yeah, it, it was amazing. I, I think you guys should watch it. No, I, I think you guys will love it. We got Made in Abyss, which I kind of convinced uh, yeah, you got me JD to watch the first episode. And he enjoyed it. 
Twitter, I don't know. I am gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start it. I'm he gonna wait to see to if, like, it. I'm think there are some shows that are on the chopping block that I'm gonna drop. So once I drop them, I'm gonna pick up that and I'm gonna pick up the Centaur anime. Show's pretty good as it sits right yeah. now. Episode yeah, one yeah. Wasn't the so Centaur one. That's good. Centaur no Nayami is also a very good show. Uh, I wouldn't recommend this to everyone. Obviously. Uh, <laughs> if you got, if you like, <laughs> if you like subtle. If you can get past the centaurs, the angels, that kind of stuff, it's a very interesting show. It's a very, it's very, it's a social study. Uh, you you have those those people you have in in society that is heavily against political uh, political incorrect political incorrectness and bigotry. You also oh okay SJWs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you also have. You have uh, highly against racism, that kind of stuff. They they have laws, and if you say something, if you do something wrong, you can get arrested. That's something real, but they never talk about it. They kind of show it, and it's it's very interesting. The, those subtle tones in Santa Ana so Miami is what I, I like the show. Watched, it's, uh, it's what I liked in I the also manga. I watched that episode one, and I'm probably going to pick up the manga because I feel like the manga is going to go harder than the anime is. Yeah, the manga, the, the manga goes crazy. I was having crazy. a conversation was, with uh, you over we that. We get. For instance, there was a uh, scene in episode one that I told JD about, and uh, if you think episode one is spoilers, I don't fucking care about your feelings. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> episode one's never spoilers. So anyway, uh, episode one, there's a scene where the teacher is talking, and you can see a officer of some kind, and obviously someone from the government. Yeah, a military guy. Uh, yeah, someone from the government and some kind yes. of officer probably military and she's talking what you can only assume is propaganda after seeing that and you hear her say the whole thing and she says the whole thing and then they'll stand up and do the pledge of allegiance and that is if that is not the most politically charged scene i've ever seen in anime i don't honestly know what is but if it's yeah. well there's also the scene uh one of the few which i also praise this show for it it doesn't have a lot of exposition <sighs> One of the few moments of exposition is when they are uh, talking about how the the humans mm -hmm. evolved and how instead of four members, they had oh, six right, members. Right. And at, at one time, they say, oh, if humans evolved to have four members, the only thing they would have uh, like different would be color skin, hair Eye skin. And, that's it. and so there wouldn't be any kind of discrimination between them. You know, it's very hard it's like there wouldn't be racism because they would be the basically same. Yeah. the same thing only with skin tones different now this uh that, if this that, that was very keeps interesting. the pace going if it keeps the political tone i'll enjoy this show immensely if it wavers at all this show will fall so fucking fast if it starts pulling some bullshit out that it'll be unimaginable how hard i will drop this because if this series stays, if the series stays yeah. on its course, if it stays the way it's supposed to be, this I could honestly see giving this series an eight or even a nine. Ooh. But if it wavers, it needs to it needs to really nut up the entire series. Otherwise, this entire thing with political commentary they're doing falls flat. If they waver, this show is bullshit. That's the problem. I think that's what they're gonna do. They're just gonna go into pandering. Well, that's kind of why I want to read the manga, because I know most mangaka aren't afraid to say something like that. But when it comes to anime, that's when the kind of differences start to bother me. Like with Fuka, like with a lot of other things, they start changing things, and those things that change tend to bother me, because it seems, I wouldn't say forced, but more kind of pathetic that they would change something just for just for viewing audiences because they think people who can read can take it but people who watch things people like you people like tori can't understand it and that's belittling and it's changing the story you're taking away from the creator's original thought process and i think that's very sad pathetic and there's really no positive light i can actually spit on it Sorry to rant in the middle of your segment. <laughs> it is also. <laughs> oh, don't worry about it. It's also about uh, like we're talking about studios. I I think I never heard about this studio, Amon Animation Company. Amon. I think it's a new one. Amon. 
Yeah. Amon. Amon Animation Company. I never. Uh, I don't remember isn't seeing. Amon the name of a devil or there. devil worshiper or something? Oh, Amon. That's a. Uh, oh, that's where uh, I've heard that name before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, it's uh, it's Amon's own uh, animation yeah. studio. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he did it. <laughs> oh no! Finally, oops. <laughs> it was, okay. Last two ones, we have Kombini Karashi. Uh, I think that show was going to be a joke. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even kidding. I was, I was uh, ready to laugh at it. But the music is amazing, and the story is kind of good. It's very, it's kind of generic, but still, uh, the characters feel believable, and I'm enjoying it. The last one, uh, I think you guys will never watch it, so I need to talk about a cute girls doing cute <laughs> oh, things. God. Uh, the one of the one of the season I would recommend is Action Heroine Cheerfruits. If you like uh Doksatsus and Super Sentai, this is for you. I I like both of those things. Wait, also, hold on. I really need to <laughs> Yeah. If you like you know those live action yeah, I like shows. Power Rangers. Uh you see sometimes. <laughs> Not Power Rangers, like you have a stage and they kind of do a Power Range stunt. Yeah. On, on the stage for a bunch of little kids. Yes, it's about that. It's about girls saving a, a fucking city Yo, from I like its Devil steps. Man a lot. That. It's, <laughs> it's, really, it's really interesting. I mean, if you want to look at it, you want to watch the first two episodes, I think they are really good. They're growing on me. The two uh, Tokusatsus and Super Sentai things that I really enjoy. And this anime is actually doing a good job, except for one girl who has delusions with trends anyway uh the one i really want to kind of rant about is in another world with myself <laughs> jd already oh, it's funny. i will, I will sit back about and listen because it's great <laughs> yeah this is the plot convenience show the i was watching the show the first three minutes of the show made my head hurt it made a headache. Just, just so all the gave me a headache on the first three we minutes. We have an actual joke about Hickey where he we say everything's Hickey fine. Mm-hmm. That's anything between like a one on score to a seven. So if he's complaining about a show, we take it pretty fucking seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically the show starts. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the show. The the synopsis: A guy dies, goes to another world, uh, goes to meet God. God says, "Sorry, I killed you by accident." I kind of flambled and you know like me <laughs> so we can go to another Drunk world Zeus, because, got it. <laughs> uh, you know it will be it will be it will be weird to to people you know to resurrect to you on, on earth and your family already saw the kind of porn you have on your computer so yeah uh, that didn't happen so he says okay i'm i'm cool with that so let's go with to another world and can i have my smartphone and he goes to his world to another world with my smartphone and he finds some kind of Asian technology. Anyway, the first three episodes of this, guy dies, go meets God. God says, "Sorry, I killed you," but you, you seem perfectly fine with the fact you're dead. And he's like, "Yeah, it's it's <laughs> fine." I mean, I didn't soak it in, and he like he's sipping uh, tea with God, and God is like, "Oh, cool. So I'm gonna resurrect you. Can you do you do you want something like to?" to take with you and he goes oh can i can i have my smartphone and can you make it work on the another world god says sure i'm gonna give you free internet unlimited internet i'm gonna (laughs) 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 and okay he's having a meltdown as he talks uh, about it you can you can call any yeah you you can call anyone you can't call anyone but i'll give you my number so the guy starts uh in the world with the smartphone a working smartphone with internet and he can call and he, and he can call God. Let let's start with that. I was like, okay. Uh, it starts like, okay, it's fine, it's fine. Then you see him in the other world. He has fucking Google Maps, and in the Google Maps, it works like a fantasy, like a a video game map, <laughs> where it shows the objectives. And I was like, okay, okay, that's fine. But it, I was like, that's fine because he doesn't have any money. And then he needs to survive. A fucking noble passed by, say, Oh my god, you have some really strange clothes, I wanna buy them. Name your price. I was like, okay, that's fine. He got the money. 
Now, how is he gonna survive? Because he doesn't know how to fight. Immediately goes to a fucking <laughs> flashback of God saying, Oh, I'm gonna give you basic <laughs> basic fighting skills so you don't die. I was like, that guy sucked God <laughs> There's no way. That guy sucked God's penis. <laughs> there's no way. He's so overpowered. Like, there's, there's, no, there's no way. God gave him the number, gave him the power. He can use fucking every single magic of the world. The rare uh, magic user can use up to three magics. Guy can use seven fucking magics. And he can copy magics of the other people. Which should be impossible. But no. Since, you know, he gave the he gave God the the, the old good old sucking. <laughs> he can do anything. He's too He's overpowered. He's got that good old sharing And the problem is he shows that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's nothing left to the show. Oh, this, God. um... The character doesn't this, need this to progress like anymore. This seems like somehow the most and because of the and least generic LN I've ever heard of. It sounds like a, a couple five-year-olds yeah, the found is... dad's liquor cabinet and tried to come up with their own story. Yeah. <laughs> Good golly God. Yeah, the, like the problem is... Uh, what happened is, this show was empty. There's nothing there. And because of that, the fact the uh, main character is a insert your face here and your name really makes uh it worse because you can see it uh you can there's nothing there to kind of max it mask mask it <laughs> you only see this guy he 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 moves like a robot he moves he talks like a robot i'm not there's even like kidding uh, every asshole, single movement he does um, the guy from no game no life no couldn't he, it's really every like single of his moves out of making plans <laughs> like he just has no downside yeah, like every 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 time he moves, it's millimetrically perfect. Not he doesn't waste any movement. It's so weird, and so you know, I don't. I I'm interesting to see where the story is going I get because it. there's nothing the story there. Story about a speedrunner. <laughs> <It's, laughs> he yeah, broke the much. game early, so now he just has to finish it. Pretty much. <laughs> and like this is not even the most plot, con like the the biggest plot convenient. Because he's gonna find some Asian technology that will make him more overpowered. <laughs> like, oh, why? <laughs> I am God. <laughs> Fucking shit. I hear what power do you need? I need to be more than. After God. hearing all these uh, shows, I, I hear a serious lack of Bullied Orphan Girl and TQ Season Nine. Well, you don't want to watch TQ Season Nine because yeah, it's hot there's... garbage. Continue. Hey. <laughs> Two, the Hi. two first seasons of TQ has been pretty good. Shut up. <laughs> oh, yeah, the ones by Mappa are pretty good. Yeah, who would have fucking thought? Uh, there's the first four seasons are by Mappa, if I'm not mistaken. So. First three. Okay, first three. Fire. Well, who cares? Time to Until talk about some no shorts. Pussy, you know. <laughs> are we going to move on? <laughs> yeah, we're going to move on Talk to talk about some shorts. Yay. At two hours, we're going to move on. Good job. Yeah, yes. 143. Let's go. <laughs> I think we're on pace for, for, uh, for our usual. <laughs> yeah. All right, so the four shorts we're gonna we're gonna go over is a piece of Phantasmagoria, Neo Tokyo, uh, Jumping, and She and Her Cat. And Neo Tokyo will be the last one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So the first one is a piece of Phantasmagoria. God damn, this shit was fucking strange. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's like, the point. <laughs> holy shit. There were a couple things I liked about it. Like, I liked that it gave off that uh, old Disney film Fantasia. It gave off that kind of vibe early on. Sure. And um, <laughs> it started to kind of, like, evolve. It started morphing its way into a uh, Salvador Dali vibe, which I don't know who's a... Uh, and for those who don't know... Kind of, yeah. He's a... It's a, it's okay, a surreal yeah, painter. A very famous surrealist mm -hmm. that I... Everyone has probably seen the melting clocks. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That's Dolly. Okay. Uh, so everything was kind of like, it's kind of warped and skewed, but you still know what everything is. Um, some things seem out of proportion, which you notice by the giant kettle that people lived in, but also the fact that there were like small plants that were fucking gigantic, shit like that. So it seems like humanity has shrunk over the years. And turned into these small little fucking gremlin creatures. Uh, this world early on seemed really like idealistic, but as that, 
as these 15 shorts that I watched as a movie, just like I believe <laughs> everyone else here has. Yes. Mm-hmm. It seemed to uh, it seemed to kind of degrade their idealistic world and kind of show you like the shittiness that that world held. Yeah. Uh, to be honest with you, I kind of feel like I I watched the series the wrong way because I watched it in that two hour chunk or that one hour forty minutes or whatever. I feel like it would have been much better if I was, I don't know, high on acid <laughs> or mushrooms. <laughs> and, what was the uh, drug of choice in 1995? Because that's when this uh, came out. <laughs> okay, it's going to be Sid. Okay, go on. <laughs> and just kind of, I feel like I would have been better off if I was, you know, either tired and just watching a couple minutes. But I was straight sober, and I watched an hour and 30, 40, 50 minutes, however long this is. I think it's an hour 20, actually. Yeah, something like that. I, t- I had however to take a long- couple breaks myself. I however did. long I watched I feel like I would have enjoyed it more if I watched it in three or four minute chunks like it was intended to be watched. Mm. But because of this podcast, I watched it as a whole, and because of that, this entire series suffered for it. Well, no, I very much enjoyed it, but that's because I watched mm-hmm. it before. So. <laughs> so it really set you in. The <laughs> At mood. the end of it, I couldn't. I couldn't. Yeah, I it was like the every the the voice, the very calm voice, like oh, in the in the world of dreams, I found a piece of a word called Phantasmagoria, and at the end of the series, I was almost sleeping. I couldn't uh, keep my eyes open. I've- so like it, it I was really in the mood to watch to watch it. It was very relaxing. It was a very interesting world. Although nothing was happening. Sometimes you had some very weird shit happening, like walking buildings. People living inside of bread. Uh, yeah. You had this people living inside of bread. The whole town making stars. alcohol. Uh, yes. The whole town a hotel in the alcohol. ocean. Yeah. Also. Also the the santa claus mm-hmm. <laughs> so all, all those those little things and sometimes you realize these stories they are happening most of the same time yeah it's so surreal like 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 San, joe senpai uh, said it's so surreal it's so surrealist it's so good to just lay down and watch it i think if you want to if you if you're listening to us talking to it and if you want to to watch this those shorts i would advise you to watch before sleeping it's so good it's so it's way better than this way if i was like sober midday watching this i would be really really <laughs> i was i was, was kind definitely of my that problem. person um i felt bored after three episodes i thought that the art style seemed like someone booted up uh, MS Paint in Windows 95 and made this. <laughs> probably did. It's mean, <laughs> not exactly out of the realm of yeah, possibility. Probably <laughs> did. Um, I thought the mu- I thought the music was like the a consistent soft piano was fitting of the the mood and setting that they were trying to do. Um, as I was watching, I felt kind of a surreal moment where it was bringing up memories of my childhood watching or reading Dr. Seuss where oh, I can see that you get this sequence of real or imaginary beings trying to mold with reality and that's kind of what phantasmagoria actually means it so, kind of felt like um the cat in the hat when thing one and thing two started exactly yeah, yeah okay. every every single piece of phantasmagoria felt like its own individual story yet in a connected world which to me, is what Dr. Seuss is. Lorax says, don't cut down the trees. Well. <laughs> uh, now, uh, to One me, fish, two of... flesh, red fish, blue fish. <laughs> <laughs> to me, a piece of Phantasmagoria right. was... Um, I was interesting. I was interested by it, but... Um, I'm not going to lie. I kind of threw... Uh, when we were talking this topic... Uh, Everybody was kind of in an agreement that we should have four shorts on there. And this kind of went on there because it fit the time frame. Uh, I knew very little about it. And uh, yeah, it fit the time frame for what we, li- what we like pre-2000. Uh, but um, 
for me, it was kind of one of those was like, it's, I like the surreal feel, feel of it all. And I kind of like the whole, like, you know, I, in the dreams, I went, went to a world called Phantasmagoria. I found a world called Phantasmagoria. And it's like, and then kind of just go into there because it kind of just, I don't know, kind of picturing it all as just some weird ass dream. Just, I don't know, sits well with me, I guess. <laughs> mm. But at the same time, I'm sitting there and at the same, uh, like, the, the entire thing ends and I'm like trying to think to myself. So what I get out of this, well, nothing really. Like it was, yeah. I didn't, I wasn't bored and then like, I didn't hate watching it, but it's kind of like when it ends, I move on with my life and I don't, I will never think of that. Like, uh, I will never think of a piece of, a piece of Phantasmagoria ever again. It was. Until you go to sleep at night. No, I won't think of it then either. It's just kind of. Yeah, you should, you should watch to go to sleep. I actually watched night. it at night, so I went to sleep not too long after. I uh, really, I really didn't like it. I thought it was, I thought it was boring. Honestly. I thought it was a, I thought it was a. Fucking! I thought it was a five out of ten, like just straight up nothing. Like I didn't, <laughs> I didn't dislike it, but there wasn't really anything to it that made made it like higher either. So it was kind of just like I like the cactus short. That was about it. In my eyes, the art was bad. <laughs> it was. The animation was terrible. There was animation. The story was the story was <laughs> nothing. I gave it a two on ten. Yeah, I gave it a three I didn't myself. Enjoy it. But again. I think it could have been. I think I gave it. A- <laughs> it, could have been, it could have been much higher if I watched it in the uh, proper five-minute format the entire time and just you know one episode a night. But because I watched it that quick, hour twenty total, I think that really hurt my enjoyment of the series. I, I understand why people would think this is fine, but because of the way I watched it and the kind of person I am, I know I didn't enjoy it like I should have. Yeah, I might be with you on that myself. You know, I my my score. I think it was the high one because I was in the right state of mind to watch the show. But if I wasn't, uh, like I had a very shitty week, I just wanted to sleep, and that was the perfect drug <laughs> to make me sleep. I slept, I slept like a baby. But if I wasn't in this this right state of mind, yeah, I think a three, maybe a four, will be a very solid score for this this short. It's interesting. We all came to pretty much consensus pretty easily on that. <laughs> um, all right. Well, then our next one, next short, is Jumping, directed by some guy named Tezuka. Never heard of. Him. Oh, he might he might be important. Nah, no, 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 no. He's, Never heard he's of a pretty important dude. Some, nah, something some something Astro, Astro Boy. Boy yeah. Something something Phoenix. Something something Pluto. Something, Never heard something, of anything, anything like this. The guy clearly. And this is the oldest doing. short on our list here of four from 1984. The and... Godfather of manga. Yeah. I would like to go last on this one as well because I want to hear what everybody else has to say on it. Okay, <laughs> I was a, I was a bit confused watching it honestly. I could tell. Yeah, well, Tori, you were on. You, you, we were on a voice chat yeah. when I was watching it, and it just focuses on something traveling through the world in this first-person view, someone, and jumping place to place. Uh-huh. And he sees many different things, people, events she. occur until yeah. the end. Yeah, I figured out it was a she later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, inevitably, it's just to repeat it over again. So why, why the jumping? What is the symbolism behind it? Um, I think I got it where it was. This is what I took out of it. It's kind of resurrection of life. Uh, how the order will inevitably repeat itself. I don't know if it got that deep. <laughs> oh. You Holy tried, crap. but way, I tried way too hard. Way harder than I did. If I go yeah, very simplistic really? on it, it was just a person develops jumping powers, super jumping powers, and goes through a bunch of different shit. Because there's a point okay. where he goes, where he lands in hell, yeah, and and then jumps out of hell again. <laughs> All right. So, what I think about this? So your basketball <laughs> is your main character, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> And in the opening act, he gets, he nearly, he, she, the, it, nearly gets hit by a car. Um, this very much does feel like something that was made in 1984. It's a strange, like, high concept. There's no real purpose to it. 
I mean, in honesty, I would love to pick Tezuka's brain on what happened here and what this was supposed to be. Maybe it did but, get that deep. <laughs> but uh, in in my thought process, I felt it was a it was a training piece. Because it's only six minutes long. I feel like he was training animators that he wanted to train how motion works, what falling looks like, what won't oh, yeah. get the uh, the viewer motion sick, what'll what'll like how motion works, how. A character should move what should move with it how the background should move in the same frame how all that should work it felt like a real a training piece more so than some deep philosophical bullshit like jd said <laughs> oh thanks <laughs> bullshit ah, that's a strong word it, uh, <laughs> are you gonna are you gonna, just, just gonna hand me yeah, that like... offense on a platter so i can take it <laughs> yeah yeah go tell a mod about it i'm sure he'll give a shit oh no <laughs> I feel like this was. I feel like this is more of a training piece about oh speed, uh, perception, and then like relative <laughs> movement in animation, and that's basically what I took away from it. It's only six minutes long. It's nothing crazy. Yeah, it's very short. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, uh, I was about. Well, I was. I was going to talk my impressions to Tori, and he said, "Wait for the podcast." Yeah. Like, okay. Uh, I was very weird by this short. Something about this short didn't make me feel good. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I was just like, really, I was apprehensive uh, because of, we're jumping across the world. But I don't know what is leading me. Who or what is this thing jumping that for some reason uh <laughs> went pretty deep on me and I couldn't uh, call myself watching this short for some reason I don't know why but that happened what happened is uh, I agree with Senpai, I think it, it looks like a training, especially with some perspective of falling and, and levitating again but I think it also has a, an interesting message that uh, doesn't matter where you are what you what are you doing? Something around the world is happening. You know, you go from a passive, a Pacific florist to a war zone, that kind of stuff. So we are talking right now, but somewhere in the world, there's, there are wars. There's, uh, there's people just living their lives. So I think that is, in, that's an interesting message. The, the short left to me when I wasn't weird about thinking, what the fuck? Is this thing jumping? Tori? Yes. Um, no, <laughs> uh, like, I definitely think, uh, just like he said, I agree with Senpai. This is, seems oh, well, like too, the, uh, this seems like a training, <laughs> this seems like a training piece. No, but listen, this seems like a training piece, right? Because it's definitely trying to showcase motion. You, you notice because it's kind of, it's kind of awkward the way it moves. Like, but it's definitely like trying to showcase, you know, especially with 2D animation, trying to draw the like, focus in through, like, to the picture you're moving forward. If you're jumping up and down, like, it's it's very awkward looking, which it would be. However, I also think there is a there is a bit of a story there, and not as deep as you thought. But essentially, what I think happens is we're kind of who who this person is, he, she, it, I don't care, is irrelevant. We're just watching this from first person perspective. However, it wants to showcase the what I think. It wants to showcase like how the the world essentially. It's like you're jumping, people are living their lives, people are working, stuff is constantly going on, the world is constantly moving. And if you see everything from people working, somebody sunbathing on their balcony, like eventually you see people they're traveling by plane, maybe they're going home, maybe they're going on vacation, who knows? Uh, but, but that's what they do isn't important. You're just seeing these people in their moments of doing whatever, and that kind of keeps going until you go into the ocean. You end up in the in the ocean. You see the whale. You go up further, and then you kind of come into foreign territory. You end up in a different country. You see war. You see combat. You see people dying, and then you kind of end up in an explosion that sends you to hell. Um, to which you get sent back up and you're back back to square one. Uh, what I feel right there is kind of... I think the point where why it kind of decided to go to war 
and kind of send you to hell. I think the the whole message there is essentially like stuff happens, like people live their life and whatever. And depending on where you are in the world, people's daily lives look very different. There are places in the world where war happens and conflict occurs. This is a normal thing for some people. Maybe not you, but there's an, it, this is like nor, normal everyday life for some people. And the reason why I think they send you to hell and back, and especially I think the important thing there is they, that they send you back out, is because I think it's I think they're kind of trying to tell us say that it's like just because you live uh, live a normal everyday life and not filled with conflict doesn't make you a bad person, even though other people do. Uh, so I feel like there's kind of the entire thing has a, in my opinion, a lot of small things. Not a big overall story, but like a lot of small things that he wants to communicate very quickly while it keeps doing this quote unquote animation exercise. At least that's what I took from it. But maybe I'm looking too far into it. I don't know. <laughs> we might we we might be the guy in no. the uh, in the in the art museum where someone put a pair of sunglasses on the ground. Maybe. Oh my god, I love that. <laughs> We're actually the guy in the car. <laughs> <laughs> who almost hits the main character. <laughs> <laughs> and we're trying to interpret why the sunglasses are the next eccentric piece of artwork of the century. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, like I said, that is definitely a possibility. Garbage. Uh, that is definitely a possibility. But at least that was, when I watched it, that was essentially what I took from it. That was what I felt. the bag floating through him. the air. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> uh, well, our third one, and we'll have Hickey go first on this one, since that seems to be our thing. Uh, someone goes first with their interpretation. Is She and Her Cat. And it debuted at 99, so it kind of qualifies, but it came out mass to the masses in 2002. So we're kind of cutting it in a Fucking weird way. Cheating. Uh, but oh, it came out in 99, oh, oh. That's, when it, that's when it debuted. Oh, so oh, screw off. <laughs> she and her cat directed by <laughs> makoto shinkai are we talking about everything follows as well it's the well uh heck you take it she and her cat well uh, first of all i i knew that this one was related to another short which is kind of more recent which is called she and her cat everything flows but i had to watch this four times to understand where it was in the in the chronology <laughs> and I think it's very interesting uh, how you see the the life of this woman by his by her cat perspective, and not only that how her uh, how her cat thinks and, and acts. Like when he he's talking to another cat and he goes, "I I don't have time to to play with you because I have this uh, mature woman at home and." I, I really I really enjoyed it. It's very simple, it's very short, but it it tells you a very compelling story. Um uh, sometimes not even using words. Uh and I think that is very, very interesting. I, I think it makes Makoto Shinkai who wrote the story kind of shine his genius shy shining in this kind of, of setup. Okay. So I personally believe um, <laughs> she and her cat, the starting point, I believe is the full title in English. Uh, I think she and her cat is much better than the new short Everything Flows, <laughs> which is very odd because there's less time, there's less investment, and it's actually the end of the story. It's, to my knowledge, after she and her cat Everything Flows, while coming out many years before. Uh, I feel like I re I relate to um I relate to the main character more. I feel like it's I want to say directed better, but I I feel for <laughs> I feel for the cat and the the girl the woman the working woman who owns the cat. I feel for her more in less time than I felt for the owner who is the same character in Everything Flows. Um, I think that just kind of speaks to Shinkai in general. I'm not sure. Uh, fun fact, Shinkai is actually the voice of the cat in this short. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's amazing. 
Corey. Okay, me. Uh, no, <laughs> I didn't actually get that right away. I didn't think about the uh, fact that this actually comes after technically everything flows. But I do agree. I did like this more. I didn't love. I didn't really like this uh, this short either. But I liked it more than everything flows because to me everything flows was too long and essentially boiled down to life is hard. And you can yeah. kind of draw the same parallels in this one. Life is hard, but it's more like not just life is hard. It's more like to me life has many ups and downs, and li life can take sudden turns. I've seen like for example when the girl just gets a phone call all of a sudden starts crying. We have no idea yeah, why. Yeah, well, it wasn't so much life is hard as it was life is shitty yeah. in this one. Kind of, right? But it's one that's like, she gets a phone call and all of a sudden starts crying. It's we have no like idea I can what... relate to this right now. We have <laughs> no idea what's going on because we're watching this from the perspective of the cat. <laughs> the cat doesn't understand anything. The cat only knows what it sees. The cat only sees his owner. She's crying for some reason. Who knows? That's kind of where I feel like the entire short, short like, keeps us the entire time. It, like... It allows us to kind of try to make out what is going on, but ultimately, we don't know. We're the cat. The cat has no idea what is going on. <laughs> the cat is just there. We just live there. We just experience this time, <laughs> these moments with her. Honestly, I got nothing out of this show other than life. Life go. Life <laughs> has its ups and downs. You move on. That was it, and that's been grained into me so hard growing up. I was really? like, okay, yeah, I know that. <laughs> but you pulled so much out of the last you one. Fucking... I tried. You pulled yeah, so much out of jumping. I, yeah, I know. It's I'm a weird person. <laughs> but no, and this this speaks to if something's trying to give me a message that's been already beaten into me since I've been a small child. I get nothing out of something like this. You just think to yourself, like, well, no shit. Doesn't everyone know that? And that's it. That's it. Well, yeah. And this is a great example of that. You go, of course, life sucks. Life has its ups and downs. Duh. <laughs> shit, I'm Does going through one right not now. Know that. <laughs> I'm going through one right now. What did I do? Well, I better have fun now than while I have the chance, because life's gonna get pretty shitty soon. <laughs> so. Oh, that's kind of. That's kind of the problem. Yeah, it, think... it just forces you to you know, <laughs> at least think that way it's in some fashion. But again, I didn't feel for Everything Flows. I also didn't super heavily invest in this. At the end of the day, I gave this a 6 out of 10, which is above average. I think that's but, what I gave it. I gave but it it's not well. ground-shaking. It's not going to fucking change your perspective. It's not. It's four minutes long. It could literally be a music video. I would, I would actually take this kind of in the same way that we took Jumping and say, I think this is mostly just... Uh, Shinkai trying to play with perspective. I think <laughs> that's, that's essentially around. essentially what he's trying to do with this. Is he's playing with perspectives. Oh no, I gave it a five. He's yeah, he's understanding how different objects, beings, things would play with it because it's not it's not long enough that he thought he was going to make money on it. So I totally see where you're coming from. Yeah, you're not making any money off something four minutes long. I mean, you might, but I fucking doubt it. I wonder if I wonder if Shinkai had a full on like movie esh script to something Probably like this, not. not just a short. <laughs> Probably not. He's a very good director, but I mean, he's also not a stupid man. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where you get that idea from. I could almost no, see this as something he planned at like school or something, like a school project. So what? What did you yeah. guys give score wise for jumping? Uh, jumping, I, I believe a... I gave it a five. I did as well. Seven. I think I gave it a seven. Yeah, I think it was a five. Let me look it up just to make sure. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna look it up as well. Sure. So the I shorts gave, aren't doing. I gave it a high. seven. Yeah, I gave it a seven actually. Well, except for Tori my and main, jumping. I gave it a five. Yeah. Well, see, my main problem is I don't feel like something that's only five <laughs> minutes long, unless it's fucking amazing, actually has the time to grasp me or the time to make me feel anything super strong. It's just kind of something I understand i give yeah i gave yeah. jumping a six yeah it's yeah, just kind of something on... i watch and i understand that's that's really all it is there's nothing deeper than that for me yeah we're so all seem to be in the same special. ballpark of each other mm -hmm. uh, which is good except tori with a seven you're crazy <laughs> I, got, I got a surprising amount of amount of stuff out of that story if yeah, see, yeah, or we, story <laughs> right <laughs> Well, that leads us into our last one, which is actually a three-parter. It's called I mean, Neo Tokyo. A piece of Fantasmagoria was technically a 15-parter, if you want to go there. 
Well, I mean, this is actually a movie. This is yeah, by Studio Madhouse. Madhouse. In the middle of the street, <laughs> I'll say that every time. Stop doing that. So, part one is Labyrinth. Part two is called Running Man. Part three is called Construction Cancellation Order, and they're all <laughs> directed by someone different in three yeah. different, totally different art styles. Mm-hmm. And, and then it's somehow very it all kinds apparent. of. Yeah, it's very apparent. Uh, somewhat racist at times. That's fine. <laughs> somewhat, he says. It's horrible. You think it's only somewhat. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a racist person. <laughs> I'm not a racist person. I just don't care. <laughs> just German, not the major. Uh, German <laughs> descent. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, now it matters. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, part one Labyrinth is directed by Rin Taro. And what I immediately got out of Neo Tokyo was it reminded me of Memories. Have you guys seen that? No, not yet. Satoshi Kon did uh, part one of Memories, and then part two and three were also totally different. Hmm. Um, They're OVA kind of movie situations. Yeah. Hmm. But I, I felt very much the same watching Neo Tokyo and with this older art style, older storytelling techniques. Uh, a lot definitely resonated with me. So, part one follows this strange small girl and her cat as she her cat. she's going through this mansion-esque area and she ends up falling into a labyrinth. And this definitely gave me vibes of the uh, of things from like a Tim something you'd see out of Tim Burton. Uh, the movie Labyrinth with David Bowie. It's I very. Was, uh, it's I was very feeling trippy. more Pan's Labyrinth, a uh, more recent movie. While uh, I was yeah. watching this, yeah, where you just kind of come into contact with characters that don't fit, they don't match what you should see. Right. It had this very gothic background thing going on. Um, a lot of detail. Something you could see out of, oh, I don't know, maybe the manga Berserk. <laughs> I've seen a don't lot of them. background detail. A, a, and I mean, them. crazy <laughs> amount. So I'm wondering why <laughs> Madhouse mm. doesn't do Berserk. <laughs> now. Because they're busy being poor. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, what does my notes say here? Jesus. I, don't, I can't <laughs> even read that. <laughs> <laughs> anyways it was, it was it was very trippy she ends up somehow in a circus of sorts at the end uh what did what did everybody else get get out of this well I felt like she was chasing around the movie it <laughs> uh, uh she's following a clown through the streets <laughs> willy-nilly for no fucking reason she has pants on up to her nipples mm-hmm. and hey you can't you can't deny those were uh pretty sweet pants uh yeah i guess so I don't really like chest high pants, but I guess they were pretty all right. Mm-hmm. So anyway, um, so you can grow I... into them. You don't need another new pants for many, many decades. Yeah, man. <laughs> Get with the times. Well, I'll come off and say I gave this part a five. I thought this was average. average. It was um. I thought it was definitely it was the weakest of... out of the three. I would oh, have to hell, with that. no, it wasn't. I would have to I thought, um, it was interesting enough. It was animated fucking acceptably it was fine um the story was really not to be seen she just kind of chased her cat around and then started following a clown and didn't get eaten somehow all the way to a circus (laughs) Uh, and then basically watched the circus and fell into a mirror and that was basically the end of it that's fine it was kind of nothing for me um it was kind of just the epitome of an average like baby's first deep kind of show uh, uh, I assume we're breaking these down into episodes, or I can just keep yeah. going on the rest of them. Okay. That would be, yeah. Okay, so my thoughts on the um, first one was kind of... Uh, I have to agree with JD. I thought it was the weakest of them. I didn't really get much of it. It was kind of just seemed to stuff happened for the sake of happening. It was like, okay, uh, trying to follow, follow the cat, falling into the clock, and it's just like, whatever. It's into a labyrinth and they're actually ending up at a circus and i'm kind of just sitting there the entire time going okay that's that's fine i guess i don't really know what i'm supposed to like get from this that 
It felt Bears like there. more of an artistic piece than trying to tell a story or anything. Yeah, and I think that's what yeah, a lot of these nothing. shorts are. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I haven't really like given any like thought, given that any thought to any scores or anything for the specific parts, but uh, I definitely thought it was the weakest one. <laughs> Yeah, I also think it was the weakest one, but it was an introduction to the other two Definitely. stories. You know, I think it it was very artistic. I I, I aside from the the claw because the claw is <laughs> weird as fuck. Uh, I I wouldn't trust that guy. I really enjoy. I really like the the grow and the cat design. I like the circus going through the labyrinth. It reminded me of a piece of phantasmagoria with the the buildings the walking buildings and and walking poles going to work uh so yeah i think it was pretty much artistic uh you have a lot of uh interesting choice uh, like designs in uh, designs like you have a a kind of modern setting with cg I think I don't think it was CG. Probably it was uh, drawing, uh, drawing to look like uh, 3D animation. But you had a part of the labyrinth w that showed this digital world, and then you go to the circus. You follow the the weird claw. Go to the circus and look inside of the and somehow you don't die. And then you start. <laughs> yeah, I was I, I was I was thinking the girl will die. Definitely, I was like, oh, she's not getting out of this alive. <laughs> yeah, I thought she was as good as dead. <laughs> Especially when they closed... Yeah, when when they closed up on the, the Klaus face, I was like, yep, she's gonna oh, get... Oh, no, raped. there it is. Die. You got dark. <laughs> the end. Anyway. You got labyrinthy dark. So, yeah, that was directed by Rintaro, yeah. and he's a very, very but... famous director, to say the least. I was surprised to even see his name associated with this. Uh, I mean, he does do some artistic shit, that's for sure. <laughs> No, but this was a, this was a different kind of artistic to what he's used to. This was kind of just strange. <laughs> well, like, speaking usually, of strange, usually he does strange bug good. Speaking of strange, it definitely got stranger <laughs> <laughs> going into part two. <laughs> uh, it's the Running Man, directed by Yoshiaki Kawajiri, who's another really famous dude. A lot of key animation roles, director roles. He's done just countless things. Uh, let's see, what would be his most famous? Batman Gotham Knight. <laughs> Who's the director? <laughs> sure, we'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Ace of uh, <laughs> uh, Storyboard Ace of Diamond. He did Genma Tyson, uh, Garo. Key animation on Redline. Ashita no Joe in between her. He's just he's just done a ton of stuff. Yeah, um, his list doesn't stop. Uh, Redline, he can't animate a Redline. So, what, so this followed this death race champion, and by death race, it's like an indie car race, but the cars explode and people die. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and it shows this this reporter kind of following this famous driver. What was it? He was he was undefeated for what ten years, fifteen yeah. years, yeah. something like that. In a career in a career that normally so lasts no, like yeah, a couple years. of races. Ten years. <laughs> <laughs> and it follows this driver basically mentally breaking down during like not during a race, but due to the races. And I guess he's developed psychic abilities for some reason. Mm-hmm. <laughs> His mind is so broke. His mind his, is his so mind broken. Is so getting, broken getting, it went to a new level. From it. <laughs> and as soon as someone passes him in a race, he f has this like mental destruction, and he crushes and kills the drivers in front of him. And he starts to see basically spirits of other drivers, and he has to, and he, he essentially dies during the race. Mm. trying to kill the, the the ghosts in front of him trying to pass them and be and win the win a race at that point it just shows this reporter occasionally saying an occasional line uh it's like man he's he's a broken guy he died <laughs> tough shit yeah. <laughs> mm. 
and yeah. it's violent. <laughs> oh yeah. I think this part was the weakest part. Oh yeah. I think the shock value is what did it for me. Yeah. I... Yeah, that that didn't affect me because I I basically saw it coming, but I felt like part 2, the death race was just a very overdone thing. Uh, I liked the animation in this part a lot more than part 1. Yeah. I did li- I did like seeing all the muscle groups even though he had way too many for his neck. <laughs> <laughs> I liked seeing those t- and his start eyeballs to kind of start to kind of contort and the blood start coming out. I liked a lot of that, but the story was very nothing. More more so nothing than the first in my opinion. And I didn't care the entire time. I wanted to know where the girl went part one the whole time. I, I was know half expecting she her. was going to like show up at some point. <laughs> show up in the car. I kinda was she there. like shows up in like in front of him during the race and he spins out of control. <laughs> yeah. I kind of was too, but the problem with part two is it's so disconnected. They're all kind of disconnected. Really, I really didn't care about part two. Like it, it feels like it should have been its own thing. They are its own things. Like, they're technically well, not connected. Mm, they're no. put together as one in the way that we watched it, where you like, if you watch it streaming or something. But if you go to Mal and Steve, it's like, they're all separate. They're not supposed to be connected together like that. They are separate stories. I didn't like part two. No, I, I no. think it was the worst one. I uh, wanted I re- to give it a really four just because of the, uh, just because of the lack of any care I had for anything in the series besides the animation. Yeah, part... I think part two should be a full-on series. Twelve episodes, I, let's do I it. I agree. Part two was that's for a, me... Uh, that's a movie already. It's called Death Race. I don't know if you've heard of <laughs> it. It's up. pretty fucking famous. Uh, part two? Part two was No, I want the... this dude. Psychic ability guy who kills yeah. everyone. <laughs> part two was for me the best. Easily. Like, I, I like that way more than Autistic anything spirit. else. And I don't even care. It's for the most shallowest reasons. I just like... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Bless you. I just like seeing. Uh, I just like seeing Bless that you. guy eventually just break to the point. It's like, I don't even care. It, it, it makes no sense. He breaks. His mind breaks to the point where he gets psychic abilities. That makes no sense. But I don't care. The moment I just saw that he was destroying stuff with his mind, and I'm just like, yes, people are gonna die in this death race, <laughs> and they're not gonna die because they're crashing. They're gonna get torn to shreds. And oh boy, did they! <laughs> Just seeing that guy literally like <laughs> break every car up piece by piece as they pass by, I'm like, yes, crashing into each other, burning, and eventually when he starts seeing the ghost, like how he's just literally ripping his own car and himself to shreds, and I'm just like, you know what? This is not dark. This is technically what you could call edgy, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I I enjoyed the same dr. I think it was very, very stylized. Or especially, it's kind of... It was pretty cool in that way, yeah. Which was... Yeah, it was It was very cool. I didn't understand <laughs> shit. <People> <laughs> Suddenly the guy... Guy start autistic screeching <laughs> out. And... That part was hilarious. <laughs> the reporters it's next a... to him in this... in It's still in the <laughs> cockpit of a car. And he's just staring, staring there and he just starts screaming <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah and then he has psychic powers like the the bloodbath i enjoyed i enjoyed uh how he chased after the the ghost i enjoyed how he was his own destruction he caused his own destruction uh quite literally because he entered the race and he raced for 10 years how mentally break down how he went berserk but it doesn't make any sense it would be fine if it wasn't for the psychic powers, I think. The psychic powers kind of... Come on, it's the future. Off and I couldn't get back. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. But the race, the characters, uh, the, the, the narrator, which is the reporter, and, every, and everything else, it was very interesting. <laughs> the problem is screaming, eyes... And psychic powers, but still, I think it was better than the first part. This reminded me quite a bit of Angel's Egg. Like, if you combine part one and two, it felt like I was watching something taking a lot from Angel's Egg. Man, I really liked Angel's Egg. Mm. It, it's it's 
it's artistic in nature without much use for dialogue. Uh, the difference is, obviously, we get more out of Angel's Egg and we get almost nothing from these two parts. <laughs> yeah. Angel's Egg is also longer. <laughs> well, just by virtue of it being, you know, multitudes longer. Right. More but time to tell a story. Angel's uh, Egg is also kind of a, a different story. Yeah. Where they're leaving, they're leaving more up to you to figure it out than... Because this story still kind of lays shit out to you. It still kind of tells you, like, this guy's fucking breaking down and shit's going really wrong right now. Yeah. Whereas Angel Lake <laughs> just kind of says, this is the world. I mean, here you go. <laughs> to quote, to quote yeah. Oshi. To quote Oshi when we got in Angel Sag, when mm-hmm. asked, what is the story about? His answer was, I have no idea. <laughs> this is the guy who made the movie. <laughs> I don't fucking know. It's a girl with this thing. <laughs> it's a girl with an egg. Yeah. I got drunk one night. No, and... there was a, there's yeah. a, the other guy who basically wrote the story, like basically referred to me, like, talk to him. He probably knows. I just directed the thing. <laughs> I was just starving for work. Nobody would hire me. <laughs> <laughs> what you gotta do, right, is you just get all your friends together. And you don't tell them, but at the end of the movie, you say, "Okay, every time someone asked me what was going on, we're taking a shot." <laughs> <laughs> well, now we're on part What's three here. Happening. Construction cancellation order directed by Katsuhiro Otomo. Has he done anything of note? No, never. No, never. Yeah. No, just that Akira thing. Yeah. Okay, so nothing. Yep. Yeah, nothing, nothing, right. me- nothing, nothing memorable like Metropolis or Memories or <laughs> Steam Boy. I don't know. Nope. <laughs> nothing. nothing. Well, they all were involved in Metropolis. Mm-hmm. Much later. Yeah, but he's the scriptwriter. Yeah. He's so important guy. this <laughs> this story uh, is a comedy. <laughs> so yet cool. another complete. <laughs> Tone difference and setting and everything from the previous two. It's a it sets a in a construction project in a country that's going through some turmoil, and it's <laughs> primarily operated by robots, basically only robots. And a, an appointed foreman shows up by the company that's doing this project to basically shut it down. And it focuses on the robot essentially not listening to the foreman. <laughs> that robot was broken. <laughs> no, that robot was fine. Yeah. That robot Get that is, pipe. Was a I, I love the opening with <laughs> Put the guy. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. I love the opening <laughs> with the guy when he's just showing up there, throwing his baggage at the robot, and like completely ignoring it, asking for like identification. <laughs> and it just keeps going after him, asking for identification. And at a certain point, the robot just goes like, "Okay, you know what? Screw this." You give me your identification, or I, or like I'm gonna have to eliminate you. And as he fucking prepares to eliminate him, he just starts signing his identification. It's just like that. That guy, he's used to dealing with this shit. <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> he's not even faced by the fact that the robot literally just threatened to kill him. <laughs> so this is where the racist character comes in. Yeah, he's got the big buck teeth. I mean, this is back to a Shida no Joe uh, trainer. Cortes, Cortes, buck teeth, big slanted eyes. He's got the round glasses. I mean, you don't get much more stereotypical than this. <laughs> uh, senpai, was this your uh, your favorite part? This was my favorite. It got a hard six out of ten. <laughs> oh uh, man, it you was were harsh on all these. <laughs> it was also the longest. Uh, it felt. It felt kind of the most cohesive because, you know, it had a story arc. It was the longest, so it had the most time to do this. But it had an actual story arc that concluded. uh, Guy gets fucking caught by Psycho Robot. Psycho Robot feeds him. He can only eat one time this entire time in case anyone noticed. He can only (laughs) actually eat that food once. The rest of the time was fucking sludge and robot parts. Yeah, he was going insane. (laughs) So he starts fucking flipping out because who the hell wouldn't? This is all after he got totally screwed by those boat workers that definitely knew what was fucking going on, so fuck them, they're assholes. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so shit goes down for a while, he does a couple inspections, uh, the robot tells him, 
no, you're not going anywhere actually, because you're gonna stop the operation. Fuck you. We're gonna we're gonna let you die in here. One day the robot comes in to feed him. He clubs the thing to death with a with a lead pipe, and goes on to uh, reach the core, which we never saw, unless I'm crazy and no, we didn't see <laughs> no. stop paying attention. And uh, then we meet up with no, the girl no, from part one. Yeah. And that's how they all kind of got cyclical, except for the guy who died in part two, which has nothing to do with the entire story <laughs> now that we've seen that. No, clearly his all. spirit is powering the core. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's actually screaming his way into the core, into the robots. <laughs> uh, I think the circus is at the bottom of the core, and the death race is circling is the race Okay, homeboy, here's what I'm going to tell you, that uh, this is going to be Dante's Inferno, and the circus is actually the bottom layer of hell. Okay. <laughs> You know what, the though? death race is somewhere in the middle, and then this construction site is constructing the top, the lightest part of hell. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna go and I'm gonna go out on a limb and say this because I didn't really think about this until now, but I think part one is leading us to the circus where we eventually get, get end up seeing this death race that then fucking stops, goes into the other thing, which is this construction. Before it eventually comes full circle, where we're kicked out of the circus. That is the end of the show. <laughs> no, what happens, right? <laughs> what happens is all we have is it starts up, and we go to the circus, and then we have Itano just screaming in the circus <laughs> while a bunch of rockets shoot out. <laughs> and they all go wild in different directions, and then they come in and converge on one target. And then we have the Itano Circus, the end. <laughs> Ma kudos. Ma kudos. <laughs> I quite and enjoyed Neo That is the Itano Circus. Uh, you can look that up on TV Tropes, which is where you'll get stuck for the next seven hours should you decide to touch that website. You could also <laughs> just Google it or go to YouTube and yeah. search it. <laughs> oh, man. Which will bring you straight to TV Tropes. Well, guys, I really enjoyed Neo Tokyo, despite a lot of its flaws. I don't think. <laughs> I think it, I, Tori, I caught exactly what you just said uh, while I was watching it. Yeah. And I thought it was cool how everything was kind of coming together and you get three separate worlds. Um, mm. Obviously, I got something completely different from our senior person, Joe. <laughs> yeah. You gave it a hard five out of ten total. <laughs> yeah. And you Four said... plus five plus six is 15 divided by three is five. Five out of ten. Yep. <laughs> I gave it a seven because, like part part two and part three, part two was being my favorite. I just I liked it. Part one dragged it down, but you know, I eventually still overall being three parts, three uh, three separate parts. Me enjoying two of them. It's like yeah, I felt that, that seven was, you know, well suited for that. <laughs> Thoughts, Hickey? No, uh, I enjoyed it. I think it was the best short completion it was what i was expecting aside for the second one because like i said i didn't <laughs> understand what was going on but i think it was what i expected i had a lot of a lot of fun i although i think the first part was the weakest i still enjoyed it i think it was a interesting piece mm -hmm. of art not a piece of animation that's what but i took as well art. and there's a very big statement to to make uh, I think it it was really good. I think this I I can recommend this, and I think I will I will recommend the second one to my friends to see what they <laughs> tell me about it. Because that shit was weird. The third one I really really like it. It was just Akira vibes yeah. all the way through. <laughs> the psychopath robot. I like how it ended with the guy going nuts and going to the central core to destroy it while the company tries to uh, like tries to reach him and say look we are not uh canceling the, the construction mm -hmm. anymore you can stop no they were gonna start <laughs> it back up yeah they were gonna they yeah, were because the coup the because the coup was over yeah <laughs> sort of like uh foreman uh continue the project yeah. we're not canceling it anymore <laughs> Yeah, like I said, like, so he doesn't care anymore. He just wants to kill the fucking <laughs> He's robot. Had enough. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, I think it was the best part. So, would uh, you give it overall? I'll give it a wow. six or seven. I think I, I, right. I can give it a seven. I was real happy with everything that this one did. 
<laughs> um, this was the only one that got above a five for me, and it was an eight out of ten. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, oh, I wow. really enjoyed it, and I could make a lot, of, a lot further arguments on why each part individually was really good and how it all came for full circle. So, I can justify it, but I can definitely see where uh, where Joe's coming from as well. And even then, a six isn't that far different from an eight in the end. Well, I gave it a five. <laughs> oh, I thought you gave it a six. Never mind then. That's when it starts getting. That's when it starts getting far. <laughs> well, average to very good is a very different score. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought it was very good. Well, that just cool. proves we're two different two different people. It's almost like we have differing opinions. Yeah. yeah. No, no, we have a list where we agree yeah. on what what's good and not. Yeah. Obviously. So now is a little bonus shit. thing, just to finish this, finish out the cast, and that's Tori and I talking about TQ. Before we do it's that, a short, okay. Hey, before we do that, I just want to ask. This is going to be really quick, but I just want to ask everybody: How do you feel? Uh, like, how do you like this topic of doing shorts? I mean, uh, it didn't bother me much. I did like having I different things to talk about, but um, I would, I would uh, prefer a a longer running series. Just because there's more to talk about for each thing. Mm-hmm. I don't mind this every now and again where we're talking about different topics. Because we're talking about, you know, the three things from Neo Tokyo, which are very different from each other. Followed by Phantasmagoria, which is different on its own. And then a bunch of other stuff. But as it sits, I didn't mind this very much at all. Yeah, I, I think it, it's an interesting topic. Especially because we can go around different shorts and talk about especially these stories how these stories come to be uh, they are usually closed stories if you don't know what a closed story is is when it actually ends and there's nothing mm-hmm. to it anymore uh, we can talk about direction styles because most of them are just studies and i don't mind doing it again yeah i've, I've never really watched shorts before so this was actually a really cool new uh piece of the anime industry that I've never seen before, honestly. And I was I was very excited. It it gave a lot of artistic appeal to the side of the industry, which mm. I really appreciate. And uh yeah, I can't wait to see more shorts now. Yeah. And that was kind of what I was hoping to get out of that with this topic as well, because I wanted something I wanted to do something a bit different. It's like I'm I'm fine with doing old shows and, you know, full of stories or movies or whatever. That that's fine. I just, since you wanted people to, like, since you wanted us to pitch topics, I kind of wanted to do something a bit different. It's like, because shorts, and especially if you look at, like, seasonal anime, see anime that comes out now, and look at the shorts there, most mm-hmm. people probably won't bat an eye at them unless it's like, okay, I'm in for some, com- I'm, I'm in the mood for some comedy. But I want to kind of, like, take a look at the, quote-unquote, artistic shorts, the more, like, the more rough ideas if that makes sense, like the one where it's yeah. like kind of like with Neo Tokyo, which is technically just three friends coming together and wanting to create something. That was kind of the plan behind, apparently, from what I understand, that was apparently the plan behind Neo Tokyo was just three people wanting to create something. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I can I can definitely say uh, watching something like Memories is definitely something to look for. Uh, I would recommend. It's yeah. very similar to this kind of short style from the past. Mm. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, that is definitely on my list of stuff to watch. And it's and it's made me more open to that kind of anime, and that led to me actually watching TQ. <laughs> well, before we jump into this bullshit, I'm going to say nothing about... I do feel like shorts are kind of like... um. I kind of view them as movies. Kind of. So the nice, so the nice part about them... Is if you can get a if you can portray a full idea in five minutes, Tori, myself, Hickey, JD, I know that we can because we talk for hours every day. Maybe not Hickey all the time. Sometimes not JD, but in general, we talk for hours every day about stupid shit like this. That's what started this whole podcast in general. And doing shorts just means we can hop ideas more. Mm. I'm thinking. Uh, I'm thinking. Sometime soon we should do, you know, Metropolis or a movie, like a high-thought movie. But uh, I thought this was a nice change of pace from what we were doing before with Ashita no Joe and Gunbuster and Kari Kano because we had to sit there and talk about one thing 
and we wind up talking about one of them for two hours. Yeah. A lot to talk about. <laughs> well, of course there was. We didn't agree, which is a good thing. Mm. We shouldn't agree. We're not the same person. Yep. That's something that I think a lot of podcasts now lack that I tend to uh, shy away from. Right. Mm. Sound like echo chambers, as they say. Which is why we're going to be talking about TQ Senpai. <laughs> good. I'll be uh, not talking. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll be short in case. I'm sure you will. Except for the fact that this shit exists, and the reason why it exists is because Berserk 2016 exists. Hey, 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 fucking shit show. That was season nine. This thing, this thing started back in 2012. <laughs> Don't care. Fuck this show. Uh, <laughs> so JD, I, 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 I had a challenge for you, and uh, I still want to ask: How would you present TQ to people? How would you say? How would you explain TQ to somebody that? Has no idea what this is. They've never heard of it before. Uh, let's see. What did I... I described it, it as... an animated migraine. Shut up, Sampai. <laughs> no, no, no. I said it was a hyperactive tennis comedy short. I don't know. It hurts. <laughs> yeah, I like that description. <laughs> uh, no, because what happened was I kind of... Um, I started watching uh, TQ because I couldn't sleep. And I just decided to put something on. And it's like two minutes an episode. And... You know, you finish a season in 20 minutes, that's fine. <laughs> that's nothing. So I just decided to put it on, and to my surprise, I actually liked it. <laughs> I was not expecting that. And uh, the way I describe it is it's rapid-fire comedy and references and whatever they want to put in there for like one and a half minutes of runtime, because there's a 30-second opening. And, uh, well, I felt... when I, Every time I say that, I immediately feel like that does not do the show justice, because that doesn't really explain what TQ is. It just kind of explained what's in an episode. But it doesn't really tell you, any, tell you anything about how the show actually feels. The show kind of feels like four people, because there are four main characters in the show, four people talking at you at the same time at hyperspeed while other stuff is happening on screen. And it's kind of funny. <laughs> and they sort of try to throw it all around involving tennis in some way. Like the first... Yeah. The first short piece is the one girl trying to teach the other girl how to hit the ball, and she's just rapid fire joking how bad she is with, <laughs> well, what if I change my pose? And she's coming up with crazy poses. Uh, what if I swing this way and just wacky swings? Um, what if I break the laws of physics? <laughs> Oh yeah, what if I yeah, and then they throw shit like that out there where she like becomes two people if I break the law of ah don't worry about it. <laughs> don't anyone care so care about the loss of physics? No. <laughs> but what what gets me is the fact that it's two frames back and forth up and down because it's mm -hmm. never just their lips; it's their whole body that goes up and down, signifying they're talking. And yeah. something happening on the screen. And it just repeats that frame. And as I'm watching it, and because everything's happening so fast, the colors are coming at your face. <laughs> and your brain can't process the colors fast enough with the people talking as fast as they can. So then your brain melts. <laughs> oh, no. and, then it, and then the show ends, that episode. And if you're watching on Crunchyroll, you see the bar flying across the screen as fast as you're watching it. You can't comprehend everything quick enough. Then the next episode happens. You're like, I can't handle this. And your brain resets just uh, to melt again. <laughs> and I yeah. found after five, six uh, of these episodes slash 12 minutes, I literally had a stress headache from actual physical pain the show was causing me. And it's not like the show's bad. It's just too hyperactive. If I <laughs> didn't have... I don't have ADD. But I was questioning if I did have it at that point. Like, I contracted it from the anime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the anime does make, you ask, uh, does make you ask a lot of questions of yourself. And not necessarily about the show. <laughs> I've many times que questioned myself because I enjoy TQ. I don't get stress headaches from it. I sit there and I like what I'm seeing. And I enjoy it. I laugh at some of the jokes. Not everything. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that just flies right by me and I don't even notice. But... It system. seemingly it's, all it's, builds up to a punchline at the end. That's what yeah, it tries to do. It does. And, um, I mean, it does have uh, sort of ongoing jokes, like you talked about the tennis thing. But, I mean, the ongoing joke is that technically they never play tennis. It's like, 
they have uh, I'm not sure if this is in season two so I don't think you've seen it but it's like they have jokes where it's like they invite the newspaper girl to talk about the tennis club and literally they do anything but tennis and it's like when they finally go play some tennis they start playing pong like, <laughs> start playing video tennis. games they're playing pong and stuff like that and it's kind of like and the same thing they have this ping pong they have this game when they're trying they're on a you know training course so they're, they're there to train in tennis they end up playing tennis table tennis that is and the joke there is table tennis is better animated than their actual tennis matches <laughs> well it's they kind of parody uh, a lot of things most they parody of the time. Any, they parody everything yeah. <laughs> it's I won't be watching anymore, to say the least. <laughs> I'm probably going to end up watching all nine seasons at this rate. I can't, I can't, I can't do it. But will I joke? Will I joke about it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You make me sick. <laughs> uh, joke. Stop supporting this shit. Give me no more Berserk 2017, 16. For us, well, as I was, as I was watching it, I thought, oh. So this is why Berserk looks the way it does. These are the people working on it. The people? There is one guy. <laughs> the person. He's the problem. He is Shin a virus. Itagaki is the one who made TQ. And for those that don't he know, he's also the guy that directed Berserk 2016. Uh, yeah. He makes TQ by himself. He, he probably made only... Berserk by himself as well. <laughs> the way it looks, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. So that was a little... To be honest with you, I gotta respect the commitment to the shitty series. <laughs> it's not shitty, Senpai. Give it a rest. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> yes, it is. No, it's not. Uh... <sighs> well, yeah. That's all I got over TQ. Yeah, I mean, there's, like I said, there's not much to talk about. I didn't actually think we were, uh, we were going to talk about it at all, because it's kind of like... Like I said, like I call it, it's the anime version of you kind of had to be there. <laughs> I don't think you need to. <laughs> if you go, if you're gonna, th- if you're all. gonna understand what I'm talking about, yes, you do. No, well, I think you need to you watch just it. Don't. No. no, you need to be there to understand cancer. You just kind of know it's cancer. It's not cancer sent by God. <laughs> you're so bullshit. negative. <laughs> you're just, you just passed me bullshit down the line. You're so oh, negative. Man. You would be this negative about it if it, if it, they didn't use Berserk to make TQ season nine. You're right. I wouldn't care about it. <laughs> uh. Well, I think it's time for our final little shout-outs. Uh, this has been the Worldwide Weebcast on Red Lead Retrocast. That's what we're going with. You can yeah, find the right. you can find this amazing podcast on iTunes, on Google Play Music. You can now find us on Stitcher Radio. You can find us on TuneIn Radio, YouTube, and Vidme at Musenspiel, and probably a plethora of other things that rip from <laughs> the the places that we're at and this is brought to us by david's tea damn good tea <laughs> drink it summer's great how about that anybody else got their things like their twitter handles whatnot find me at full metal lax on full metal underscore lax uh we have a mal group now yes, which is uh www.cast parentheses red leaf retrocast just search us the link's too long we're not gonna send it ah <laughs> uh, the link's not too long i can I, it'll it'll <laughs> definitely be in the description of the uh of every episode from here on out all right all right good right you can find me through the group yeah you can find me through <laughs> the group as well you can go to my mal right. you can see my twitter it's in my mal if you care i don't tweet anyway so yeah. <laughs> Well, I, t- I tweet all the time. Uh, it's mostly just retweeting just random anime and video game stuff, but I do tweet out what needs to be occasionally. I spend so. most of my time making fun of JD. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> Fuck so our next, our next podcast is looking like uh, maybe a week or two from now. We're not too totally sure, but we'll be covering Two Heart, which was Hickey's pick. Oh god. Yeah. 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 That's gonna be fun. It's our first uh high concentrate <sighs> visual. It's also a visual novel adaptation. <laughs> well a visual novel adaptation. A good visual novel adaptation. If you <laughs> No I don't me. So gonna be fun. Gonna be fun. An M rated visual nope. novel. It's oh, okay. Porn. It's yeah. porn. Okay, gotcha. 
Never mind. I'm on board now. <laughs> All right, I'm I'm yeah. way more in now. <laughs> <laughs> You're a little bit more receiving now. All right, Red Leaf Retrocast Worldwide Weebs. Are we Fuck out, guys? Harmony Gold. <laughs> Peace. Peace. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>